Uh, my name is Anissa Asabi, Georgia, at-large city councilor, and I am the temporary chair of uh, this committee. I am joined this morning by my counselor, fellow colleague counselor, Kim Janey. I'd like to remind you that this is a public hearing being recorded and broadcast on Comcast 8, RCN 82, and Verizon 1964. It is also streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV. I would like all in attendance to please silence their cell phones and other devices. If you would, uh, when you are presenting, please um, just your name and your affiliation. If you are signing up for public testimony, there is a sign in at the front door. If you could sign in, uh, that would be helpful. This is a budget review that will, um, this is one of our budget hearings, uh, a review process that will encompass over 36 hearings over the course of five weeks. I think we're about halfway through. We strongly encourage residents, whether here in the chamber or at home, to take a moment to be engaged in this process by giving testimony for the record, whether in person or electronically. Uh, you can do that a few ways. Um, we also have a p moment for public testimony, a hearing dedicated to public testimony only, only on Tuesday, June 5th from 2 to 6 p.m. We will be here for that entire time frame or longer. Testimony can be submitted to ccc.wm at boston.gov and also mailed to the Boston City Hall. Today's hearing is on the Boston Public Schools Human Capital and Equity uh, Department, which also includes diversity, recruitment, evaluation, and staff retention. Dockets, let me just read these here. I, uh, I don't give Mark enough credit for going through all this. Dockets number 0559 through 0563, Orders for the FY19 operating budget, including the annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and a, an appropriation for certain park improvements. Dockets number 0564 and 0565 are the capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. Um, today we are joined by three members of the Boston Public Schools Department, um, and we may add ad others as needed. Uh, we're ready to go. Thank you. Great. Great. Good morning. My name is Becky Schuster. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Equity for the Boston Public Schools, and I'll be opening today with sharing the work of the Office of Equity over the last year or so. It's, uh, thank you, Chairwoman, for the introduction, and good to see you, Councillor Janey. Appreciate uh, the work that both of you have been doing in partnership with the Boston Public Schools. I'm joined here today by the staff of the Office of Equity, who are seated in the front row to my left, uh, Stephen Chen, who is the Senior Equity Manager, and Grace Jung, our staff assistant, our full-time Northeastern co-op student, Lizzie Beagle, and any moment now we will be joined by our Director of Compliance, Gina Pierre. I'm excited to be here to share with you the work that our team has been doing this year, and we continue to work in four areas. First two areas are responsive work, where we respond to concerns that are brought to us regarding bias-based incidents and sexual misconduct. Uh, the second responsive bucket of work is around responding to requests for accommodations, both disability and religious accommodations. And then our two proactive areas of work are providing education and training, and lastly, bringing an equity lens to every aspect of decision making in the Boston Public Schools. So I'll be telling you about our progress in all of those areas. Uh, this is the, bu the budget for the current fiscal year and the proposed budget for the next fiscal year. And these numbers reflect level service. You'll see a slight decrease um, in those numbers that are reflecting central office-wide reductions that are achieved through non-personnel efficiencies. So we expect to have our same team. I'm excited that we've been named uh, a a location for a Leading for Educational Equity Fellow in the next school year, so we will increase by one FTE for this year through that fellowship program. 
In terms of our equity policies and protocols, we are always seeking to improve the effectiveness of our policies and protocols. This year, uh, we have been working with published protocols for the first time so that we can give detailed guidelines to school-based personnel as well as central office supervisors when we need to ask them to assist us in collecting information about a possible occurrence of bias-based conduct. We also continually improve our circulars, our internal policies as a district. This year, one of the most important improvements was incorporating the um, new Pregnant Workers Fairness Act into our circulars. And lastly, we're looking forward to launching a new circular in the Office of Equity this fall because of many requests from families regarding our students who observe cultural and religious holidays that are not uh, days off from school. We want to make sure our schools are supporting those students um, by excusing their absences as appropriate and providing makeup work. So that will be a new circular arriving this fall. Try that again with advancing the slide. Tell me to work All right, on I'm going to let you work on that. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. In terms of our responsive work, which hopefully the slide will come up in a moment. Not working. Um, if, if there's assistance yep, there available. We oh, there it. we go. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, as I mentioned, this falls in two areas: our investigations and accommodations. I would like to call your attention to the staggering number in the first bullet that we have to date this fiscal year responded to nearly 800 employee, student, and family requests for support. And to give you a sense of that number in context, the year before our new Office of Equity team came into place in, um, with the Chang administration, there were a couple dozen documented requests for assistance and response. So we've seen a dramatic increase over the last few years. And I think there are four reasons for this. One is we have added a very significant um, bucket of work under our investigations um, overall area, which is sexual misconduct. Uh, the Office of Equity is now responsible for internal investigations regarding sexual misconduct. Second, we've seen a dramatic increase in reporting uh, we've done a lot of work to make sure that our students, our families, and our employees are aware of what types of incidents need to be reported to the Office of Equity so we can determine what assistance is needed. So a big increase in reporting. Third, uh, we've improved our tracking. So we are carefully documenting uh, every incident that's brought to our attention, every request for help. And lastly, the current conditions of society that have increased certain kinds of incidents. Um, and we feel that in the Boston Public Schools as well as across the city and the nation. So in terms of those nearly 800 requests for help, that includes investigations that the Office of Equity conducts. That includes consultations that we provide. That includes us coaching school leaders and central office supervisors when it's a relatively minor incident, we will support them to address it. And that includes responding to disability and religious accommodation requests from employees and religious accommodation requests from students. Whenever there is a serious incident, we try to assess whether there's a bigger need there. Um, is it enough to investigate and, for example, take disciplinary action? Sometimes there's more needed there. So sometimes we need to intervene in a classroom, sometimes school-wide, sometimes district-wide. So to give you a quick example of that, uh, recently you may have heard that there was a uh, very destructive social media campaign that originated in the United Kingdom called Punish a Muslim Day. And this was in early April. And we had a number of students, Muslim students, who were concerned whether it would be safe to come to school that day. We heard about it from a few different schools. We addressed it on the school level. For example, one of our principals in partnership with us made the decision to call every single Muslim family at that school to say, we will keep your children safe tomorrow. And in addition, we worked with the superintendent to send a letter directly from him to every school leader, letting them know about this campaign, letting them know that their Muslim students might have concerns, and um, offering options for how to proactively address those concerns. So that's an example of the way that we, we don't just respond to a specific concern, we try to have a broader impact than that. 
In terms of our training and education efforts, we've conducted nearly 80 training sessions this year in the Office of Equity. This includes our standard equity protocols training that we've been rolling out over the last few years. And I think the most important accomplishment in that category this year is we have now trained almost 90% of our school administrators. So prior to this, we were at 100% participation by principals. We've now added every school administrator being required to attend, and we look forward to achieving 100% soon. We've also been conducting welcoming schools trainings. These primarily focus on gender inclusion as well as gender identity sessions. These are often requested by schools where a student is transitioning, um, identifies as transgender or gender non-conforming. And lastly, we've been partners, partnering with the Office of Opportunity and Achievement Gap to deliver racial equity tool sessions so that people who are in key decision-making roles in particular know how to use the Boston Public Schools racial equity tool as they make those decisions. Uh, we continue this year to provide remedial training to students who violate an equity circular as well as remedial training to employees who are found to violate an equity circular. Other education efforts include our website where it has been updated to have an opportunity to bring concerns to our office through an online reporting form. And we also have an online protocols training available so that anyone can access equity protocols training. We're very proud to have hosted our second annual conference just a few weeks ago, Emerging Best Practices, Preventing and Addressing Bias-Based Incidents in Schools, and you can see our logo for the conference there in the slide. Uh, over 200 educators from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island joined us to learn from the work in the Boston Public Schools as well as some of our partner organizations about how to do this work most effectively. And we were especially pleased that we got a grant this year, we had numerous grants, but uh, one that was particularly meaningful to us was a grant from Teaching Tolerance, which is the education arm of the Southern Poverty Law Center, who supported our conference, and Maureen Costello, their director, also was one of our keynote speakers. We're uh, holding our second equity poster contest. You might remember uh, seeing our equity posters in every school that uh, launched a year and a half ago. We are holding our second uh, contest this year and look forward to putting new posters by Boston Public School students in all of our schools this fall that will be focused in an age-appropriate way on preventing sexual harassment, um, particularly between students. I continue to lead an ongoing group for white members of the district leadership team to do our own work on racism. And to, uh, we have been continuing to partner with Boston Latin School. We're near completion of the second of a three-year agreement with the Department of Justice and making sure to not only meet the, the requirements of that agreement, but to exceed them. And lastly, in terms of that fourth bucket of work of bringing the, an equity lens to decision making across the district, particularly a racial equity lens, uh, we continue to partner with the Office of Human Capital on efforts to hire and retain teachers of color. And in a few minutes, Emily Quasabash will share much more information with you about that partnership. We participate in a wide variety of department meetings, working groups to uh, make sure that there are folks at the table applying the racial equity tool, thinking about issues of equity at every stage. One particular project I've been involved with this year is the Opportunity Index Guiding Coalition. We have been building capacity, as I mentioned in the training slide, around uh, making sure that folks who are in, are in decision-making roles are familiar with how to conduct an equity analysis, how to apply an equity strategy. And one quick example of this was in the implementation this year of the 21st Century Building Fund, where, as you know, uh, the mayor allocated a one-time $13 million fund to make purchases of state-of-the-art furniture and other equipment for our schools. And in partnership with the uh, Office of Opportunity and Achievement Gap, we required every school leader to complete an equity analysis of their plans for purchases. So we wanted to make sure every school community was thinking deliberately about how to use those purchases to close opportunity and achievement gaps. Um, and, and that was an exciting project to be part of. And lastly, I continue to serve on the Boston Alliance for Racial Equity Steering Committee um, with the goal of being part of broader city efforts, a public-private sector partnership towards racial equity in Boston. That concludes my presentation, and I'll now turn it over to um, Emily Kozelbosch, and then we will take your questions at the conclusion of her presentation. Great. 
Thank you, Becky, and thank you, counselors. And I echo Becky's uh, thanks for your partnership, both this year and in previous years. Uh, my name is Emily calais Kuzelbush, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Human Capital. I'm presenting today with Saren Daly, Managing Director of Recruitment, Cultivation, and Recruitment Programs. And we are joined here by a number of our staff um, and partners um, in the audience, so thank you all. As I've spoken with you all over the past four City Council budget hearings, we've worked to set equitable district-wide conditions for success in BPS. Mutual consent hiring, the, uh, the hiring process by which teachers apply to schools and schools select teachers, is now how we do business and it enables other strategic work that helps ensure that each school has a strong instructional team. Strong instructional teams will close opportunity and achievement gaps for our students. To focus, we organize our work into three priority areas that I'll discuss today. Ensuring that we have the right people in the district is cultivate and recruit. Ensuring that those right people are in the right schools, hire and deploy. And ensuring that we keep our talent in our district and help them to develop to the top of their potential, developing and retaining. What we have been doing now over the past year is differentiating our strategies and reallocating resources within our office so that schools that have specific needs receive resources to address them. This strategy aligns to our new organization as a district that I know that you've heard about in previous hearings. Today I'll talk about how resources in the Office of Human Capital are differentiated in two main ways, to schools that are lower performing and to schools that have lower than average diversity of their teaching workforce. I want to share with you the context of who our educators are and why we know that we still have critically important work to do. Boston Public Schools primarily recruits locally. Uh, this is because we know the, the statistics that bear out nationally and here that 80% of teachers choose to teach within 40 miles of their home. We do this recruitment in a state where only one of 10 graduates from education schools are teachers of color and in a national context where teachers of color are retiring at a faster rate than they're entering the profession. We are proud of the fact that BPS far exceeds the national average with a teaching workforce that is 38% people of color. In a state where only 7% of educators are teachers of color and where Boston Public Schools employs 6% of the total educators in the state, BPS hires almost half of the black educators and one quarter of the Asian and Latino teachers in the state. I have only a few minutes today to present and a lot of data that I want to share with you so that you can dig in and ask questions. Um, so I have three points um, to walk through on this slide. Highlighted in the chart on the top left are the gaps between the diversity of our student body and that of our teaching workforce. We are not satisfied that these gaps are large and we work relentlessly every day to close them. The line chart at the bottom zooms in on the change in our workforce demographics from year to year. With 4,400 teachers and fewer than 10% new teachers every year, changes in demographics move slowly. Take a look at the blue line, which shows the percent change overall for black educators over the last couple years. Well, we have for the past few years seen slight decreases. Last year, we saw about three quarters of a, of, a point, of a percentage point increase. Similarly, the orange line depicting movement in the percentage of Latino educators is moving in the right direction. As I will dive into next, last year we saw real improvements in our hiring efforts that resulted in a 5% increase in the overall hiring of candidates of color. This was driven by an 8% increase in the hiring of external candidates of color. These are the new educators entering our system. On the other end of the spectrum, we saw a significant reduction in exits by teachers of color, including a 50% decrease in exits by black educators and about 10% decrease in exits by Latino educators. We are pleased but not satisfied with this progress. And I wanna tell you that this was our best year yet uh, in recent history. We are one of only a few districts that have seen increases in the numbers of teachers of color um, in recent years. Part of the reason for this shift is that we've done strategic work across central office departments, primarily with our Office of Equity, in order to give schools differentiated supports. 
To show you what this differentiation of resources looks like in practice, this slide highlights the menu of supports that about 20 of our schools, called diversity-focused schools, received. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see the resulting overall changes from last year to this year. The blue line represents the 20 schools in this cohort. On average, the candidates who self-identify as people of color hired at these schools increased by about 10% from 29 to 39%, which was a key piece of the district's overall increase in hires who self-identify as people of color. That's the orange line that moved from 40% to 45%. The Diversity Focus Schools Initiative is one example of how we have differentiated supports for BPS schools. This initiative lives within a larger suite of strategies in our office. The top of this page, the funnel graphic, shows what we do in OHC to bring new educators into our district. In the same way that we've differentiated our strategies for low diversity schools, this year we've been differentiating for lower performing schools because we know that talent is a critical lever for increasing student achievement. This new work, this is new work this year. We look forward to reporting outcomes related to it next year at this time. We also know that it is equally important to grow and retain educators once we have them in the district so that we have strategies across our office for performance management, development, and retention of our educators, particularly our educators of color. This slide shows just one snapshot of how we use data as an office and set goals for our work with diversity-focused schools and low-performing schools. One of the most important ways that we ensure that we're both setting the right goals and meeting those goals against our strategic priorities is through the robust use of data. We've worked hard to use data to ensure that we are strategic and adaptive in how we allocate our resources. As a large office, a significant amount of our day-to-day -day work is the core function of payroll and employee services. This work ensures that our 10,000 employees can focus on providing the best services for students because they're paid on time and receive their due benefits. We continue to carefully manage the budget to ensure that we can continue mutual consent hiring. Next year, we project a reduction in the overall cost of the suitable professional capacity pool by almost $1 million, and we will be saving $500,000 per year in open post stipends that are no longer required as part of our new contract with the Boston Teachers Union signed last August. This year, we're investing more in our leadership development pipelines as we know that the leaders in our building, buildings are critical to student success. This includes a slight expansion in our Lynch Leadership Fellows Program and a new partnership philanthropically funded with the University of Virginia School Turnaround Program. This concludes our presentation and we look forward to discussion about BPS's focus on human resources. Thank you, thank you all. Um, Councilor Janey actually beat me here, so I'm gonna allow her to please go first. Wonderful. Uh, welcome. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Um, lots of questions. I, I guess I'll start with the equity side. I um, was wondering if you could provide an update on where things are with Boston Latin School. Absolutely. I'm going to ask Senior Equity Manager Stephen Chen to come join me here. He is the person who leads our work at Boston Latin School. Is he? I'll say while Stephen is coming to the microphone that uh, we're, we've been so enjoying working with the new headmaster of Boston Latin School, Rachel Skerritt, and are so pleased that all three of our exam schools are led by people of color for the first time in Boston history. And uh, Headmaster Skerritt has been doing wonderful work around shifting the culture at Boston Latin School, and Stephen will tell you more about our partnership uh, between the Office of Equity and Boston Latin School. So with regards to our efforts at Boston Latin School, um, we are finishing up year two of the DOJ compliance agreement. And so each one of those pieces, I think there are a couple of key components. So the first one is 
Um, we have continued working with the students, the staff, and all the administrators on making sure that staff not only know how to report incidents that happen at that school um, that may be bias-based, but also how to identify them. And then also working on developing um, more of a culture where students are feeling comfortable going to specific people to report those incidents. So um, last year, the school brought on Beth Verano to kind of be the point person for all bias-based incidents. That has continued this year, and um, we've been continuing to partner with her. Um, on that work. In addition, um, we've continued working on building the tracking systems at the school so that we have a clear snapshot at any given time for um, the incidents that are occurring at the school. Um, and it tracks all sorts of incidents. So there's bias-based incidents as well as like tardies and everything like that. And so um, that's another key piece. Um, so that's, that's the training and the culture piece. And then in addition, um, we are working with Sangabi Law Firm to do a audit of the school um, and a school climate audit. We um, are not done with that yet and we anticipate getting that done um, sometime at the end of June to mid-July where we will get a sense of the progress that had been made since the last um, audit that was done. When was the last one? That was at the end of last year. And um, where is the school, and it's wonderful, thank you for bringing up um, the new headmaster. Mm -hmm. it's, it's great to have her as a former student at VLS yeah. and teacher and administrator within the district back in the district leading that work. Tell me though where we are, if you could give an update on where they are in terms of increasing diversity in the student body as well uh, with the teachers and staff, either of you or any of you. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of um, student diversity, um, the primary focus we've had in the district this year has been around diversifying the exam school initiative. And um, Colin Rose would be your best source of the details about that, but I've certainly been in partnership with his office um, in that project. So we've been trying to ensure that all Boston Public Schools students have access to uh, tutoring for the test, to information about exam school entrance, um, and to diversify the applications to our exam schools has been our primary focus in the recent right, past. And so I asked the question because, you know, as uh, these incidents arose at Boston Latin School and in other schools and other industries, you know, across our country, racial isolation is, yes. is one thing that really contributes to this unwelcoming feeling. And so the more that can be done to increase diversity, um, Dr. Rose was here, I think it was last week. Mm -hmm. And while I think more students are gaining access through the exam school initiative, it hasn't yet resulted in more students at Boston Latin School from yes. what I've seen. Um, and in terms of hiring, where are we at that particular school? I'll say, and then we'll see if um, uh, Saren Daly or Emily Kozlebosch want to add, but uh, last year, Boston Latin School was one of our diversity-focused schools. The criteria for selecting diversity-focused schools are two. One is a gap between what the teaching um, staff looks like in terms of demographics, racial and ethnic demographics compared to the student body, and second, a critical mass of openings. Last, in the last hiring season, Boston Latin School fit those criteria. This year they have so few openings that they're not um, among the cadre for diversity focused schools. But you can be very assured that Headmaster Skerritt is highly prioritizing increasing the number of uh, teachers of color there. Um, and last year when they were part of the diversity focused school cadre, they were one of our most successful schools in terms of their numbers. And, and in terms of um, curriculum or Course of yes. work there, what is happening there? Yeah, there's been some very exciting work on curriculum. I'll say a little bit, and if Stephen wants to add, he can. Um, last year, we had uh, faculty were required to participate in, they had some choices, but they had to participate in some kind of work around shifting the racial climate at the school and the curriculum. And many of the faculty opted to be part of a uh, cohort that examined the uh, reading lists, the curricula, uh, initiated the first ever African American Studies course at Boston Latin School. So we are seeing exciting changes in terms of what Boston Latin School students are studying and reading. Is that course offered as an elective or as a required course? I believe that is an elective. So I, 
obviously you know through my work on the Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force would like to see us move forward um, in a different kind of way where these are not being offered as electives, mm -hmm. but that's something that all students benefit from. And I think we, there's plenty of research that would bear that out. Um, I want to kind of do more big picture now. Um, so we looked at one particular school. Yes. You mentioned that you responded to nearly 800 uh, cases or employees. Could you request talk for assistance? Request for assistance. Could you talk about what some of the types of sure? What kind of assistance people would like? Yes. And is it mostly employees? Is it mostly students? If you could kind of break that down. Absolutely. In a more detail, that yes. Would be helpful. So the majority of our requests for assistance are around employee to employee issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, an employee feeling that they are working in an office where there may have been uh, microaggressions, for example, racial microaggressions, or an employee who feels that they have been subject to um, uh, other kinds of uh, potentially bias-based conduct. Um, that includes requests for accommodations. So employees who need, for example, a, an ergonomic chair um, in their classroom and because of a disability that, that they may have. Um, it includes uh, school leaders who have an uh, incident that uh, may be, while it may be age appropriate, may have sort of walked up to a line around how students should be respecting each other's bodies, and now a teacher or a school leader is calling us to say, how can I intervene in this classroom where there may have been some touching that was not entirely respectful between two kindergartners. Um, so there's a big range of the kinds of concerns that are getting brought to us every day. Some of them are relatively minor and some are more serious. And, and how are you, um, you or other arms within the district really uh, taking advantage of the Me Too movement to use that as a learning opportunity, not just for our young people, but throughout the district? Is there yeah. a new uh, training available around that? You yes. mentioned so, sexual misconduct earlier. Yes, so a few things. First, um, I mentioned that we have this poster contest that's in progress. We'll be announcing winners in a few weeks so that we will have posters created by Boston Public School students in every school this fall, specifically instructing students in an age-appropriate way about respectful touching and consent. So that's exciting. Second, um, we've definitely seen um, an increase in students, particularly female students, finding their voices around these issues this year. So there have been some um, remarkable developments in terms of female students contacting our office and taking that initiative to say, this is how I want it to be in my school and how can you support us to ensure that we don't have um, any incidents of disrespect between students or sexual comments that are unwelcome. Yeah. So that's that's been good to see. In terms of training, we've always incorporated information about um, inappropriate sexual conduct in our training sessions and, for example, equity protocols training. Um, however, we have increased, because we now have responsibility to investigate sexual misconduct, we have increased training for our school leaders in that area. So we were part of the August Leadership Institute curriculum this year in sharing with our school leaders their new responsibilities around uh, investigating sexual misconduct. And we will again be on the calendar for this August to deepen their training. Um, so that school leaders have the skills and information they need to respond when there is an allegation of sexual misconduct. Um, what would be really helpful uh, for me is to have um, like a pie chart or some sort of graph that highlights the types yes. of requests. That's how we're absolutely we're framing them as requests. So you mentioned microaggressions, sexual misconduct. Like I'd really I want to understand how. Could you just tell me off the top of your head what your sense is? Do you have this data for I have some numbers you? with me. In front of you? It's, this is an awkward time of year to report out because uh, we prefer to issue our numbers at the close of the school year when we've finished cases. So at the moment, we still have a number of cases that are um, in progress. And so we can't sort of offer a reflection yet on their conclusion. But I do have some data with me. So just to give you a sense, 
Um, in terms of protected category, our largest category is race. We get the most concerns brought to us related to race. Uh, the second biggest category is allegations of sexual misconduct. And as I said, those can vary tremendously in terms of uh, very minor allegations as well as more serious. So in terms of protected category, race and uh, potential sexual misconduct are our two biggest issues. In terms of the balance of who is bringing concerns to us, um, as I mentioned, the overwhelming majority are employee to employee concerns. And, and remember that that includes all employees. So that could be a teacher, that could be a bus monitor, that could be a food services worker. Um, we Concerns come our way from every segment of the folks who make the Boston Public Schools work. Um, we have sometimes concerns regarding how an employee has treated a student. Sometimes we have concerns about how a student has treated an employee. And then, of course, we have concerns that are student to student, and occasionally also uh, parents bring concerns about how they feel they've been treated by a teacher or an administrator. Um, so we see all of those, but it's the two largest areas so far this year were employee to employee, and then the second largest area was a parent being uh, perhaps inappropriate, which, a feeling of an employee had been inappropriate with them. Yeah. Um, and that's not surprising, is we have sort of opened up as many avenues as we can for students to report to us, um, but it's uh, always a challenge for students to find their voices. And that was one of the reasons why we featured a student leadership panel at our last um, conference a few weeks ago on bias space incidents. We had student leaders from the Boston Student Advisory Council, from BLS Black, um, and another, a, and a, a student at the Burke who is participating. I'm sorry. I, I, I've got a couple more questions. I want no to make sure I get some human capital questions. So sure. just to wrap up, yeah. I no. know you've done a lot of work to um, make sure that folks are aware about your office. You've seen an yes. increase um, possibly related to just that people know. I still worry about underreporting, people yes. who don't feel comfortable, people who are not coming forward. Yes. So I wonder what efforts you're doing to really make sure that people understand that there is uh, an avenue for them yes. um, to bring their concerns and yeah. what has happened. So underreporting is always, so if you've got you know, these cases based on race or sexual misconduct, you mm -hmm. know, I'm still mindful that there are people who are not coming sure. forward who are suffering in silence and I want to yes. make sure that everything is being done to ensure that their voice um, is in be being included. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you mentioned uh, almost 100% of administrators were selected for some of these, uh, the 80 training sessions on yeah, we've, page we've trained five. A, yeah, we've, so we've trained 100% of our principals and headmasters. And almost there and for nearly 90% for all and other administrators. Are you also working with the Boston, Boston Teachers Union around professional development for yes. educators? Yes, so we, um, this year we provided two training sessions for their leadership, for their permanent staff, and um, Stephen also conducted training at the annual conference for BTU membership, and we will do that again this year. Okay, and then last question for you, Becky. Sure. <laughs> okay. It's not just you and I anymore. Okay, <laughs> so, and this is a good segue for when I come back to, to on the human capital side, mm -hmm. Um, I remember there were schools that were being targeted around diversity. I remember the diversity 10 or 20, schools. whatever, yes. Mm -hmm. How many schools? We, we choose approximately 20 each year. And we, are they still, are you still, so each year it's a different 20? There's some overlap perhaps year to year, but, um, but it's, we look freshly at the statistics. And these are schools school. who have historically it's the combination of two factors one is a gap between who is on staff and, and who is attending the school in terms of racial and ethnic diversity and then the second factor is how many openings do they have because we're oh, looking so that to, was the, that's what we're calling yeah it now. so it we're just looking has a to, new name okay I yeah see. we call, we call it the diversity focus school so yeah. we want to make sure that not only do, are we seeing that gap but that we actually have an opportunity to shift the needle in a meaningful okay. way if there's I'll one have some opening follow up. I, I'm yeah. mindful that um, no my colleagues have yes. questions and I'll have lots of follow-up questions on those sets of schools and other schools around where they are in Great. terms of um, hiring overall. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Council Janey, we've been joined by uh, Council President Campbell. Um, I just have a couple of questions to follow up on uh, the equity presentation and then uh, we'll go to Councilor Campbell's questions. You had mentioned the, um, the one principal that had reached out to 
um, their Muslim families yes. regarding that awful day. Um, can you tell me how families identify their religious affiliation? We don't have any formal um, process where families identify their religious affiliation, for example, when they register for mm -hmm. school. Um, in the case of Muslim families, generally, um, they, because of the religious garb, they tend to be more identifiable than folks with other religious identities. So, and I also think it's the good work of our school leaders that they're from, they know their families and they are familiar with their um, religious identities in many cases, particularly when um, our families are members of religious minorities. I think our school leaders are very thoughtful about making extra efforts to yeah, be no, inclusive. I, I, I certainly think that it's wonderful that the principal took that time to reach out. I would, though, caution about um, religious identification that it's not always very clear. Yes. And that there are groups of um, ethnic uh, groups that are often associated with a religious minority but don't necessarily practice that faith. Uh, so there can be a lot of confusion. So, so I, would, I would just caution um, with um, perception Mm -hmm. and reality and experience. Yes, so just absolutely. I hope that we're, we're doing that as we're making identifications on, on behalf of our, um, our families and within our school communities. But then also um, non-Muslim and non um, and other ethnic groups that are either related or not sort of related or lumped in with a particular religious group should also have that I think that uh, reach out because there is quite a bit of crossover um, sure. and impact on our families and our, yes. on our kids in particular, uh, especially considering the, the span of ages that we have mm -hmm. and sensitivities among our schools. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, racial equity tool um, sessions that were given. What is that? Is that an actual yeah. tool? Is it a toolkit? Yes. Is it what's that experience and, and what is that that we're providing our schools? Yes. So we've been rolling out the Boston Public Schools racial equity tool over the last two years. Um, it started with a partnership with the Center for Social Innovation, which is the consulting arm of the Government Alliance for Race and Equity. Um, the city of Boston, um, under the leadership of the mayor, became a member as a municipality with this national organization of municipalities that are dedicated to racial equity. And when the city joined the Government Alliance for Race and Equity, we gained access to a number of resources. And one of them is the racial equity tool that's designed to be applied to, at any public sector decision-making table. And I worked with Colin Rose to, to modify the tool for application in Boston Public Schools. We started with mandatory training for all of the members of the district leadership team. And since then, we've been offering voluntary training to the rest of the central office staff. It's also, those sessions are also open to school-based personnel. We're seeing um, increasingly more school-based personnel coming to those training sessions. And we've also responded to requests from departments. Specific departments have asked us to come and train all of their leadership or sometimes every member of the department in how to use the racial equity tool. And essentially what the tool does is, uh, is a, it's a guide to what kinds of questions we need to ask ourselves at every stage of decision making. So uh, the very first question we need to ask ourselves is, are the right people at the table? Are the people at the table who will be most impacted by this decision? Um, do we have a, the folks at the table who reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of our students and our employees? Uh, and then takes us through um, what goals are we trying to achieve with this current project or decision? What are the implications in particular for people of color in, in that work? Uh, how can we ensure that the result of this decision, this project, this program, is to close opportunity and achievement gaps rather than either maintain or, worse yet, increase them? Um, and built into the tool are opportunities to reassess over time to see if we're achieving our intended goals. Um, and we've been getting a lot of very positive feedback. I had given the example earlier of the 21st Century Building Fund, and one of the highlights for me this year was hearing school leaders say, this is the most uh, comprehensive, detailed conversation we've ever had about equity with our parent council, our site council, and, and even in some cases our student leadership, um, where, we, where we were requiring our principals to um, bring the stakeholders at their schools together to look specifically at issues of equity, particularly racial equity. Right. Thank you. And then on the budget, 
um, proposal that's before us today, the allocations from last year, we on um, track to spend what was allocated? Yes. And then what was the FY, do you have the FY17? I do. Uh, numbers? Yeah, FY17 was 601,424, so approximately 601,000. And do you we did, that was, we increased by one FTE that year. That's mm -hmm. why we saw the jump from 601 okay. to 671, uh, because we added our staff assistant for whom we are grateful on a daily basis. Great. And if there were, um, through an investigation, through a complaint, there were any findings that um, resulted in uh, some sort of monetary payment, where does that come from? So in terms of um, violations of internal policies, there is never a monetary payment. Um, our tools to address um, concerns that are investigated internally are discipline of students or employees, uh, restorative justice, mediation, education, training, um, coaching. These are the tools that we use. Monetary findings would be only, or monetary rewards um, would only occur in the context of a legal proceeding, for example, at the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination or the Office of Civil Rights um, at the Department of Education, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that would be handled by our, our legal office. Great. And then um, last year, in last year's presentation, there was some information that was shared about a district-wide assessment of gender equity within the yes. athletics department. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the action plan that came about from that, um, whether it was part of it and, and whether it's a part of Build BPS or has it informed Build, P Build BPS at all? Yes, so I think the most um, significant and exciting development that came out of that assessment is the progress we're making at the Madison Park and O'Brien locker rooms and Charles Granson is here from operations and he can speak to the progress on that project. So I'll have him come join us. Right. And is there an action plan that came about through that assessment? We are still developing that action plan. And in fact, the Leading for Educational Equity Fellow that I mentioned who's coming on board, um, we are going to make that the central focus of that new employee's work is to um, implement Title IX, including around gender equity in athletics. Very good. Thank you. Hello. Hi, hi Councillor. Good to see you again. Nice to see you. If you would just for the record introduce yourself in your capacity. Okay. Uh, Charles Granson, Deputy Chief uh, Operating Officer, Boston Public Schools. And um, so with, the, with regards to um, Madison Park, uh, uh, O'Brien Athletics, um, we sort of got off to a slow start this uh, year as we put it out to bid and no one bid on it. Um, put it out to bid again. Um, found a vendor, the work is underway, and we're scheduled to have <clears throat> the sort of preliminary solution, the interim solution um, of having a remodeled uh, um, locker room for uh, use for O'Brien uh, girls uh, to be ready as early as June. Um, so we're excited that that uh, has transpired in the way it has, and then um, the longer term uh, solution around making sure that we have, you know, um, separate facilities uh, for girls at Madison Park and O'Brien. Um, we're in pre-draft stages in terms of des design, or I should say pre-design stage, um, and that timeline and, and work is really being owned by PFD. Um, in terms of um, overall, any of these kind of projects, we're looking at it as a part of Bill BPS, and um, as it's coming out of sort of those same uh, funds. Uh, and I think next steps and a part of what we're doing overall with Bill BPS is coming up with sort of like, you know, these are, these are how the projects will roll out, roll out over the next 10 years. And you'll see whenever that's presented and shared, you'll see that as a part of that plan. Great. Yeah. I, I think that mm -hmm. it's really important that we are including that gender equity piece, especially in the athletics. And I hope mm -hmm. through that work that you include um, or, and the um, the contractor, whoever does some of the planning, mm -hmm. includes uh, female athletes, mm -hmm. at, I'd say, and uh, perhaps their coaches, um, mm -hmm. who probably hear a lot of the complaints about the facilities very mm -hmm. personally. Um, that would be great. Um, I would like to uh, recognize um, Councillor Campbell, please. 
thank you, uh, Councillor Sabi George, and, and thank you guys for all the work that you do. Um, I'm assuming you just covered the equity uh, piece. They've done both presentations. Okay, but we're but focused. Just, perfect. If you can focus um, on whatever you'd like. Okay, I'll just uh, stick with the equity piece for now. Um, Becky, thank you for the work that you're doing. I just had um, some questions specifically about the racial equity tool, um, the uh, training that you did, because my goal as council president is to bring the council through a similar sort of training that has been happening in other departments. Um, I have to give my colleagues credit. We had an initial conversation and lunch to discuss bringing this to the council. Um, but obviously, every employee is at a different space when it comes to this work and understanding. Um, I think it's important that everyone be involved in the conversation at the outset. So I'm curious, before you jump in and apply a tool and say, here you go, use this in the work, how you even get to that space? What are the conversations and trainings you did beforehand? Yes. Um, and who specifically was leading your department through the training? And who's sort of being borrowed and, and loaned out to other departments uh, for similar training? Yes, so, so far the training on the racial equity tool has been conducted entirely by myself and Colin Rose, Assistant okay. Superintendent of Opportunity and Achievement Gaps. Um, in the beginning, we tried to do all the sessions together. Now we're uh, doing a little bit more of dividing and conquering. So sometimes he's solo, sometimes I'm solo, and sometimes we do the work jointly depending on our capacity and availability. Uh, and it's an excellent question because to expect people to implement the tool requires them to have a, an understanding, an intellectual understanding, and a personal commitment to why the tool is important. So uh, in the standard format for the training, it's actually two two-hour sessions. The first two hours is on why. Why do we need a racial equity tool? Why does it require uh, an active, deliberate effort to, re to uh, reduce the effects of racism, to shift systemic racism. Um, so the first session is in maintaining uh, or ensuring that everyone in the room is on the same page as much as possible. And you know, frankly, there's some employees, they already know it. You know, they're already committed. They're already um, there. But we can't, there's no way to really assess that. So we ensure that uh, we cover two hours worth of why we need to operationalize racial equity in the Boston Public Schools. The second session is on learning how to actually apply the tool, how it can be used. We give them practice. Um, we, ch we choose a topic that's relevant to that group, and we do a, a practice sort of mock run of um, the equity tool on, on a particular dilemma or decision. Um, no, that's very helpful. I think there's um, more sort of a longer period of time I anticipate um, needing to have these conversations. Um, but I will, ta will say I'm excited about it. And one of the things I think is most important, and um, Councillor Flaherty is to my right, so is in not making sure that our, um, the men on the council in particular are not excluded in the process. Yes. Um, we often talk about we have, inc it's incredible that we have six women of color in the council, which is fantastic, um, but we don't do this work alone. We do it in partnership with all of our colleagues and some of whom have been serving longer than many of us who got here recently. Um, so I look forward to sort of staying in conversation with you and Colin offline about how we could uh, continue this conversation and work when it comes to the council, which is overseeing not just BPS, but interacting with every department in a meaningful way. Um, but how do we have the same understanding when, when uh, talking about the issues ourselves? Yeah, and I would like to add that this is by no means the first um, effort that we've made as a district during um, the Superintendent Chang's administration around these issues. So, for example, the entire district leadership team, including the superintendent, participated in the YW Boston Dialogues mm -hmm. on Race and Ethnicity. And looking around the room, um, some of you may know that uh, my colleague Matt Thompson and I actually conducted those dialogues for the members of the City Council in 2010. Yeah. And when I look at the yeah. councilors in the room, all of you have been elected, or at least reelected yeah. since then. <laughs> That's right. And none of you were sitting on the council at that time. Time, so it might be a great time to, to repeat that. And we found it very valuable f f internally. And uh, perhaps you were here when Colin gave his report. And you know they did 21 hours of professional development work around racism with our school leaders last year and another 21 hours this year. So there's deep training work happening in the Boston Public Schools around eliminating racism. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for the work you do. I, wanna, I know thank a lot of you have questions. Thanks, Councilors. Councilor, Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. I apologize for being late, um, but uh, appreciate the great work that you do. Can you? I know it was alluded to in the PowerPoint, which I missed, but can you talk a little bit about work at uh, Boston Latin School in response to the uh, 
what's happened there the last couple of years? Yeah, so um, earlier my colleague, Senior Equity Manager Stephen Chen spoke to that work because he is the liaison between the Office of Equity and Boston Latin School. But to summarize, um, first of all, we're very excited to be working with the new headmaster of Boston Latin School, Rachel Skerritt, who is, could not possibly be more committed to the work of uh, racial in inclusion and uh, racial and ethnic diversity in the school. So some of the efforts include, of course, being in compliance with the Department of Justice um, uh, consent agreement, which we are completing year two out of three years. And we're proud that we've not only um, met all the requirements of that agreement, but we have exceeded them. Uh, including training for all students, all staff, uh, training for parents, um, updating their policies and protocols around when incidents occur, um, working in partnership with them anytime there is an incident to ensure it's addressed in a very thoughtful and, and comprehensive manner, um, putting all faculty through various forms of um, training around courageous conversations, um, harnessing some of the um, brilliance of the faculty there towards the goal of increasing the culturally and linguistically responsive curriculum. So there have been shifts there in terms of what Boston Latin students are reading and studying. Um, and we are near completion with the year two climate audit, specifically a racial and ethnic climate audit that we are conducting in partnership with Sanghavi Law Firm. Thank you very much. Um, and again, I apologize for, for missing this, but I saw some, some fairly, uh, it seems, positive stats in terms of uh, educators of color, but it's about 40% in BPS, which is higher than the other metrics listed, urban cities, all cities in Massachusetts as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, we are happy to report that last year was our was our strongest year yet in terms of diversity, and uh, in large part that uh, is due when you do the math um, to the diversity focused schools initiative, which is zooming in on about about 20 schools mm -hmm. that had two things going on. One is a, a relatively large number of vacancies and lower than average um, diversity of their staff. So you can see that by by making a difference in a set of schools, we made a difference overall. Okay, and does that Next do time. those figures include um, non-teacher administrators or, or folks that work at uh, the bowling building? Uh, no, this is teachers and guidance counselors. Okay, and what are the statistics for uh, central staff administration? Central staff um, is about uh, I want to say I can find it. I think we're fifty-two percent uh, staff of color overall. I can so get that for so you. So better than the teacher and guidance better, counselors. Better than teacher. If you look at our ten thousand employees, yes. Great. Um, okay. Bit and the equity budget has gone down slightly. It's Very essentially slightly. level That's funded. That's just non-personnel efficiencies. We, we will keep the same number of FTEs next year, and we're also adding an additional FTE because we were lucky to um, be uh, the, the leading for educational equity is giving us a full-time fellow next year, which is um, a, an honor to host a full-time fellow sponsored by the leading for educational equity. Okay. All right, that's all I have for this round. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, um, Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just want to uh, touch base on uh, mutual consent hiring. So sure. what is mutual consent hiring? I know it was implemented back yeah. uh, in March, and I guess what, if any, impact has that had on, I guess, the effectiveness in, in, uh, on workforce diversity? Right. Um, so mutual consent hiring initiated, we're in the fifth year of it. Um, this is the process by which all positions are open posted. On March 1st, they go up on the website. Anybody can apply for them. Um, and that means that teachers who are permanent, who have tenure in Boston, who are separated from their position, also apply. Um, what we know about teachers hired through mutual consent um, are two things. They are more likely to be um, more effective, um, and I can tell you about that in a minute, and they are more likely to, to be a person of color. Um, we actually are working with researchers um, from Brown University who just last month reported on the results very preliminarily that both of these things have been seen to held, hold true over the last uh, four years of hiring. So currently, um, we've talked in the past about um, this, uh, this process results in a number of permanent teachers not being in a permanent position um, on day one of, school, of the school year. Um, and this is the suitable professional capacity pool um, that we've discussed before. Um, and um, what I was gonna tell you about the effectiveness of that group, um, it is not a monolithic group, although, um, 
what we what we do know about that group is that they're in that situation because often they have one license only, um, and it might be a license that is not in our one of our high needs areas. Um, they may be in that group because they don't do not apply for jobs, which I've talked to you all about before, um, or apply to one or two jobs, um, or they may be there because they have an underperforming rating. At the beginning of the school year, a teacher in this situation is nine times more likely to have an underperforming rating. It is um, one point of reference that shows us that mutual consent is kind of a check on effectiveness um, and makes it uh, a, a very strong investment in the quality of teaching. Okay. And then what's the average number of vacancies at a given time? Um, we, we filled 1,100. 1,111 last year, um, so over the entire um, hiring season. And what percentage is that? Which, what percentage is retirement versus um, move into a different district versus just burned out in new career path? Okay, so those are the number of teachers, the <clears throat> positions that were hired. Um, last year we had 396 exits. Um, let me pull my exit data. Um, so so when, when I tell you that we hired for 1,000 positions, about 378 were new people coming into the system, and the other 600 or so um, were people who are permanent teachers in Boston being hired into a different position. Yeah, true. Um, but I can tell you about exits. Um, we are, we're below the national average for exits. Um, we had about, I'm looking for my overall exit numbers. Yeah. We, have, we, have, we typically have about 350 people exiting um, per year. Um, and do we have the number? I think you said apologies. 396. Did I just say 396? I want to give you the right number. I apologize. Um, so last year we had, let me give you the exact number, 392 exits. And just to give you a sense of uh, to your question, 89 of those um, were retirement, 186 were resignation. That means they didn't have to retire, um, but they resigned. Um, then we have a number of categories um, such as dismissal, um, layoff, provisional teachers whose contracts were not renewed. Um, that add up to the rest mm -hmm. of them. Gotcha. And then from the sort of the, the school site autonomy uh, giving sort of, I guess, yeah, principals the ability to have some input and say as to who, uh, what teachers will yes. be part of their team, and obviously we're going to be holding principals accountable. Yeah. So how does the sort of the mutual consent hiring play into giving principals autonomy with respect to their schools? Yeah, that's right. Um, because they have complete autonomy, um, they're held held responsible for right. the quality of the hire. Um, this is data that is used um, there. We call them their, their the skills as being a human capital manager. Um, and that includes both the almost like the site level recruitment they do, the hiring they do, the evaluation that they do of their staff, yep. and that is rolled into their evaluation. Gotcha. So mutual consent's not, it's, you, are you looking at percentages? Are you talking about quotas? But what's the... What's the exact for, for the evaluation? Yes. Um, there's not an actual percentage attached to it. There are four That's standards right. on the evaluation. Right. It's part of one of them. And then, do certifications come into play with respect to all prospective candidates? Yes, and we so, handle that centrally. So, mutual consent hiring, we, we, everyone's certified. Everyone has their pro appropriate and proper licenses, yes. and they've been renewed yep. and what have you. Okay. Yes. And then, just shifting uh, to uh, following up on Council Campbell if, uh, on the slide, it would be page six. Uh, it says other equity uh, educational efforts. Can you just explain to me, so it says leading ongoing group for white members of the district leadership. Can you tell me what is that, what's that mean? And I think it's yes. important that we have a shared responsibility. Uh, we're all in the same boat here. I want to make sure that there's no one group, no one gender, no one pronoun, no one sexual orientation feeling that they're being sort of isolated or being felt like they're part of the problem when they're yes. actually part of the solution and there's a willingness Absolutely. to... And it's, at the end of the day, it's about the quality of education. It's about academic excellence and trying to rise above all of this uh, to get, you know, the best bang for the buck with respect to children in the classroom, making sure that they're getting the best instruction possible, making sure we're giving them the tools and the resources they need to compete in a global economy and to get into these great college universities that call Boston their home. Um, and so if you can share, shed some light on sort of, yeah. you know, what does it, I guess, it mean? What does it mean to be a white teacher in yes. today's day in the Boston Public Schools with mutual consent hiring and... Uh, other efforts that are going around this issue. 
Yeah, so that group that's referenced in that particular slide is open on a voluntary basis to any white member of the district leadership team. And to give you a sense, the district leadership team is approximately 50 people. So anyone who is white who's a member of that group is invited to join us. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to take responsibility for our own work. Um, we all, as human beings, are subject to the environment around us um, that unfortunately is, is uh, polluted with racism and we breathe it in whether we want to or not. And so as a white person, I take responsibility to uh, learn, to do my own learning, to explore my own personal and family history around issues of race, to um, identify areas where I can be a more effective ally. So the folks who are participating in that group are joining me on that learning journey, and um, I'm seeing some exciting results come from it, where the people who are participating are visibly becoming more and more effective at backing the leadership of people of color, at taking initiative to address issues as they arise, where um, racism is, um, in evidence in subtle and not so subtle ways. So I'm very proud to be part of that group and to lead that group. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Chairwoman. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I know there are significant language barriers families in need of special serv services face every day. What type of outreach are you doing to recruit excellent teachers, but also teachers that speak uh, more than one language? You, can, you want to start? Okay, I'll start, and then I'll and then I'll turn it over to Sarah and whoever sees the recruitment team. Um, so this has been one of our success stories over the last two years. We've increased the number, the percentage of candidates. Um, who speak, who are fluent in one of our seven major languages from 35% to 41% of our candidates. Um, we have a number of strategies that Saren um, will describe, but this has been one of our largest priorities. We're working closely with task forces within uh, the school committee and across the district and our partners to now ensure that the students who speak specific languages have access to teachers um, who speak that language, because it doesn't do us any good if we have teachers who speak the language but in, in the wrong classrooms. You want to speak to specific yeah. strategies? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that we know is that as a district that is so incredibly diverse um, and have so many, our students bring to the classroom so many different languages, that there's one strategy of continually recruiting from our existing pools, graduate schools, and national networks, but also making it an intentional investment in our own and our teacher pipelines. So the district uh, has two robust pipelines that are that are running right now, our Accelerated Community to Teacher program, which is a part-time program that recruits specifically paraprofessional substitutes in our community members um, to join us in the journey of becoming educators. The diversity data there is we've had 67 candidates come through our three cohorts for the last three years. 76% of our candidates have been candidates of color. 46% African-American and 25% Latino. The most significant piece there is in addition to racial and cultural ling and linguistic diversity is that we've been able to hire 40% of those candidates into classrooms, 29% in teaching um, roles, and 11% in our paraprofessional roles. Um, we also have been granted, this is the first time um, as a district that we've been given permission by SE to offer an initial licensure program, an alternative licensure program for ESL and special education, and that's our BPS Teaching Fellowship Program. We will be selecting our second cohort in this spring, um, but we have already placed 27, we've already um, hired 27 of our fellows coming out of that program, and again, linguistic diversity is a criteria um, and a, and a on a value, and these are individuals who are 100% licensed in special education or ESL. And I guess the message there is it's a both and, that we're both aggressively, through our recruitment and cultivation efforts, looking outward for individuals to come work in Boston Public Schools, and we're simultaneously developing our own. As it relates to recruitment and diversity, I also know that the school police 
um, is made up of about 70 police officers. Mm -hmm. I think there's not one Asian on the police department. Well, yeah, that is, that um, is likely. I know you are recruiting mm -hmm. now for police officers, school police officers. That should be that should be factored in that we don't have at least one Asian on the police force. Um, Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah, we have a we have a large Asian population in the city of Boston. Obviously, they should be represented. Yeah. Um, also, I know there's some issues as it relates to a combination of ESL and special education with certified translators. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think we have enough certified translators in um, Cantonese or Mandarin. Um, we often use someone in the school that can, you know, communicate with, with someone, but, 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 but they need to be certified, I understand. And I think, I think you can do, I think we all can do a better job of um, certifying, getting certified um, translators, adding more translators to the BPS staff. Um, I don't, I don't want to be, you know, using someone here and someone there. Let's, right. let's hire a bunch of these people mm -hmm. so that the special ed kids and um, ESL also have access to great education. That's, that, that should be great. a priority as well. Yeah, the Office of Equity has been working in partnership with the Office of English Language Learners on this issue, and um, they have a large pool of interpreters and translators who are now available um, throughout the district. And we also have been uh, polishing um, in partnership with those two offices, as well as the Office of Opportunity and Achievement Gaps, guidelines for schools to use, as well as the central office, for when it is essential that a document or a meeting be translated. So not only have we grown the um, cadre of interpreters who are available, but we've also set standards for the district around when an interpreter is required. That's, I understand, but we, we need a lot of work on that issue. Um, there's a lot of cracks in the system, and um, I, I don't want to hear about the good news. I want to know what the issues are and how we can resolve them. Um, so there's a lot of um, progress we can make on that issue. Um, how, how are we doing in terms of recruiting those in the uh, disability community? In the disability? Yeah, people who self-identify mm -hmm. as having a disability. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you I, will you repeat the question? Are, are you, do you do any um, active recruitment of, of um, anyone with um, special uh, disability related issues? We do, uh, similarly to the way that we talk about needing to have a, a teaching workforce that reflects the rich diversity of our students, we do very much value individuals who have kind of lived um, lived some of the, the challenges that their students are facing. I do not believe we have specific, unless you want to speak to specific strategies. I One would thing, say, go ahead. go ahead, Becky. I was just going to say what I can speak to is that the Office of Equity this um, school year to date has provided 130 accommodations to employees with disabilities, which suggests that we have a significant number of employees with disabilities um, on board. But, but go ahead, Saren. No, I was. I will specifically comment that our recruitment and cultivation team has done over 30 events, and I have witnessed by virtue of the way we set up our events that we have made it uh, definitely accommodating, and we have accommodated individuals who require different assistance to speak with our school leaders and select get selected through the hiring process. Um, Councillor Flynn, two things. One is that um, we, since we, we don't track specifically disability, people can self-report it and then we work with the Office of Equity um, where necessary for accommodations. The other thing I wanted to add is that um, BPS has a $1 million investment in translations this year. So I want to make sure we address that before we move on. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I, I asked about that, I know there's a lot of returning veterans that do have um, yeah. disability uh, issues mm -hmm. and um, they're highly functional, they're bright, they're, they're eager to work, they're willing to work. Right. I think they'd love to have an opportunity to work at BPS, mm -hmm. um, but if you are able to do any type of recruitment, uh, there's a mm -hmm. lot of women veterans um, with disabilities, um, you know, it, yep. it, would go, it would go well. I think, I think that's a segment of the population we haven't factored in or we haven't really sure. 
aggressively re tried to recruit. Um, so that'd be that'd be important, I think. And I also think, you know, if we can think long term about our police force to make sure that, um, yeah. you know, it represents the city as well, the diversity of the city, right. and that includes, um, you know, we have a high concentration of Vietnamese as well. Mm -hmm. Is there any Vietnamese on the police force? I don't. Um, I don't believe so. I don't I, that's data. this boss public schools. I don't no, think no, we, no, don't, we don't have the school, school, school police. School police. Oh, oh, no. yeah. school police. Yeah. I'm, sorry. I'm happy to follow up. I don't have that in front of okay. me, but I'm happy to follow up with that okay. information. And thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Flynn. <laughs> um, Councillor Janey. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to shift, and, and not that I won't have additional questions Anytime. regarding equity, but would Anytime. certainly like to shift. Can we just kind of take the big sure. kind of uh, view around overall hiring. So where yep. are we in the process? This is May 10th. How many yep. vacancies, do, how many positions were posted? We right. were posted March 1st. Where are we now in terms yep. of vacancies? Um, by school, well, you know, I've got lots of follow-ups. Sure, so um, March 1st, we, we posted 455 positions um, and 60% of those right now are filled. Our goal is to have 80% filled by June 1st for the reasons that we've talked about before. We know that earlier hiring is better. Um, positions are posted continuously after March 1st, um, and the current number is probably around 650 or 7. Um, we expect we have fewer, we don't have turnaround schools designated this year, so we have fewer teachers who were accessed than we have in the past, and we also have fewer positions overall. Um, so I don't think we'll hit that 1,000 positions that we hit last year total. Yeah, and so the goal is 80% by June 1st, yep. which I thought we were moving away from. We want to hire by the end of the school year that we really want to get as many hired during the spring so that other districts are not snatching up. Teachers. Early June June 1st, right. I, yeah, I heard June you, 1st. You want to, we are, we are. That so, is, go ahead. No, I, just that. We want to move earlier, so, so yeah. you're 60 percent as of May, and what yeah. do you, May 10th, what do you hope to be by the end of this and month, by the just, way, just 80 percent? 80 percent, so by the last day in May, we should be for sure at 80 percent. There's a lot more in process. Those are the, the 60 percent that I just said are the kind of signed, sealed, and delivered, finished, but um, probably another 20 percent are already in the queue, and our staff is just going through the approval process. See, I just remember the days yeah. when August, there were still vacancies, mm -hmm. the beginning of the school year starts, right. still vacancies. And the goal really was to move the needle to do the hiring. And one thing that mutual consent and open postings allowed you to do was really kind of start right. really to hire mm -hmm. earlier. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like your high expectations for us. That's good. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody's ever pushed me to say that 80% by June 1 isn't early enough. We, yeah, we have to hit the sweet spot. Um, for the time that folks who are finishing grad school and getting their licenses are on the market, which is March 1, um, and we want to be done um, before summer. So that is right. our goal. Yeah, and so of the 60% that are currently filled, yep. uh, are, are they at schools? Which schools are they? Which schools are you still looking for, teachers? And um, what is the diversity of that 60%? Okay, and gotcha. how many of those are external candidates versus internal candidates? Um, okay, because so current hiring. So usually we wait um, to, to kind of as Becky talked about with the um, reporting on e on equity cases, we wait for the kind of non awkward time just so we can um, give you the full picture. But if you want, what we could do? Okay, here we have it. Um, so of the hires that have been um, completed so far. Um, we have 25.5% uh, of them are uh, identify as black, 18% identify as Latino, 5.2% identify as Asian, and 45% um, identify as white. Of the 25 who identify as, as black, how many are external candidates versus provisionals or permanent teachers that are applying for new positions? Um, I may need to get that to you, Kim, because I want to get it. Your question, your specific question is of 
of the 25.5. And really for each of those categories, right. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. really interested to know how many of those are existing teachers yep. who are either provisional or permanent looking for new positions versus you're really adding to the pool. Yeah, um, we can get this to you for this moment in time. The pool again. We yeah. also can talk about last year's hiring. Um, we retained 82% of our, our of our provisionals of color, which is higher than any other year. So last if we wanted year, to you give you- 82%? Yep, into the future year. Um, what we do know for this year is that there are 251 of the new hires are internal and 65 are external. Can you repeat that? 251 internal and 65 external. What you're requiring of 55, the 65. 65. 65 external. And what you're requiring us to give you a breakdown of the 65, and that's what we don't have right now. And so that's overall? That's at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, you used the word deploy. Yep. On this slide, which just has me. Has it make, right. It's making me. So, are I know. teachers and principals and school site councils still the ones who are making yeah. these decisions? 100%. Or a central office? No. Okay. The, uh, it's a weird force word. Force placing. No, it, it actually, no, we are not force placing. 100% okay. mutual consent. You use the word deploy. deploy. Deploy is more about ensuring that um, we put our resources in the right place. Okay. I'm with you, and I actually may never say that word again, Kim, because it bothers me too. So, but it is about strategically using our resources. I just wanted to check. Um, so, when we look at the demographics of of teachers, uh, I'm on page 11 of the slideshow. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you use the word educators, and it includes guidance counselors. Mm -hmm. And for years, I know many people, including myself. Yeah have asked to see teachers. Teachers, right. Like I want to know, for those who are in front of children in the classrooms, what's the diversity there? And that this number's not being, and not that the diversity of guidance counselors aren't incredibly important, mm -hmm. obviously it is, yep. but I just think it's helpful to have the breakdown. Can I have it for you. Yes, I would um, We do often cut the data. In, in two different ways, and I have just teachers. So Kim, for, before um, Emily continues with that, I wanna make sure I'm clear, because I just got clarity on the, the hiring data. It's 251 total, on, and of that 251, 65 are educators of color, and they're external, 65, I'm sorry, 65 is external. So 251 is the total. Yeah, you, re you said that already. Okay, I just want to so make sure. I, I'm, I, I thought I saw it that I didn't yeah. say correctly. So I'm going to use um, our what we call our October 1 data of 2017. So Kim, this would have been for our last hiring cycle since that one is complete. Um, and I'll give you uh, the numbers and percentages of teachers by racial um, ethnic group. Um, the total teachers at the end here was 4,656. So I'd like a percentage. Sure. So that's the total number. So I'll give you the percentage. Black, black. Te mm -hmm. teachers identifying as black, 20.75%. Latino, 10.42%. Asian, 6.01%. White, 61.25%. Declined to identify 1.18%, and then other is 0.39%. I'm happy to um, provide you, this is a kind of short overview document cut with the data cut only by teachers. So I can, I can send that to you when we finish. Okay, no, that would be helpful. I would really yep. like to see that. Um, on that same slide, number 11, mm -hmm. I'm looking at what appears to be an increase um, from last year to this year in terms of black teacher hiring? Mm -hmm. And is that again inflated by the internal candidates? This Help me understand this slide. Yeah, right, right, because we, we know that we're moving the needle by the external candidates coming in new to exactly. Boston every year. Exactly. So when we focus there, um, we had an 8% increase just with the external folks coming in. Yep, I see that. Um, so that is to, to make sure we're not inflating. That's our external number. So overall, hiring candidates of color went up 5% because those external candidates went up by 8%. And so will we see a bump next year when we look at 
these numbers. And if we've been in, at this for five years, which means that we're more likely to get uh, more effective teachers or more diverse teachers, why haven't we seen the increase over the last five years? I, right, I, I would say that one of the major aha moments that we've had um, in partnership with the Office of Equity and our instructional superintendent team was around this diversity focused school initiative. When do we need to intervene and how do we need to intervene? In the past, we were waiting until the hiring process positions go up March 1st. The uh, school hiring teams would call resumes, invite people in, put forth their candidate for hire. We would look at it and say, no, this, um, you need to increase the diversity at your school. Um, this person is not a person of color, go back. Um, go through the process again at this point, it's April and May, that was not effective. Uh, that's what led to us saying, okay, we need to be much more proactive, we need to change hearts and minds, we need to do training, we need to do coaching, we need to give, we need to deploy more of our resources to these 20 schools than we give to the schools that are doing relatively well. So it is, given that we've seen the bumps last year when we moved to this approach, I would expect next year we come back, we see the same thing or even better. So and I would also add that some of the efforts, particularly the pipeline programs that are so innovative and that are a national model um, for other districts that Sarah Daly oversees, are ha those are programs that take time for us to um, see the yield um, from folks who are completing it. So I think um, the diversity focus school initiative is very important. The pipeline programs, also retention efforts. So all of these things we're starting to see the results and it's exciting that last year was the <coughs> highest increase in the number of teachers of color that we have in documented BPS history. Thank you. I'm going to uh, save my additional questions for a little later. I know okay. um, my colleagues have questions. And we're on a 10 minute round. That was that alarm. <laughs> um, we've been joined by Councillor Presley and I'd love her to have an opportunity to ask her questions. Uh, good, morning. Good, morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good uh, morning. Thank you all for what you do. Uh, our afternoon. Thank you all uh, for uh, uh, for what you do every day uh, and for being here. And um, uh, I've had a, a brief recap, so I might ask some questions that you've already uh, answered. And um, you know, I will also watch the tape. So. Uh, my first question is, the diversity working group, how long has that been in existence? And have the recommendations of that group been implemented? Are you referring to the diversity focus school initiative that we were just no, talking the, about? No, the diversity working group specific to growing the number of teachers of color. That's So we work closely with the Office of Achievement the and Opportunity Gap. Human Capital. That's the one I assume. There's two, two existing um, subcommittees. One is uh, the ELL task force has a okay. human capital subcommittee, and the OAG task force has a human capital subcommittee. And okay. both groups have been working and meeting with us regularly this year. Okay. And I would add that there is a team comprised of um, employees from the Office of Human Capital and um, myself from the Office of Equity that meet on uh, this time of year. It's often a weekly basis. So we have this amazing state-of-the-art data tracking system where we're literally looking at live data every week about how many interviews are happening in a particular school in terms of a racial and ethnic diversity, how many offers have been made and who are they been made to, how many have accepted those offers, and we're intervening in live time you know, contacting schools, mm -hmm. both um, when we see that we're not happy with the trend, but also I had the joy of sending out four congratulation emails out last week to school leaders who are having great success, um, who are leading diversity-focused schools, and their early hiring numbers are excellent, and I got to um, say, keep it up. And so in terms of that tracking and that evaluative tool, are you able to gauge that when you make certain investments or when you have done certain targeted outreach right. or tabled at certain events, what is uh, providing the greatest yield? One of the things I find you know, frustrating across uh, industry and agency or specifically in government is that oftentimes we will uh, count a touch you know, yeah. as a meaningful outreach. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't always yeah, result in a yield. So to table at an event and maybe 200 people come to the table, mm -hmm. but if we're not tracking, if, if, is there follow-up? or So I'm just trying to get a sense of those numbers. If you can, uh, based on you know, outreach and marketing, uh, what do you think has, uh, which avenue has produced the greatest yield? 
Yeah, that's the holy grail, right? To figure out exactly what we're doing. That that is that, that we can scale most. up if yeah. it, if it's if it's proven. I can speak to one um, exciting outcome for us this year. We began the year knowing that one of the major um, areas that we lose new teachers are the teachers on waivers or teachers coming into our system in general is around the MTELs and passing certification. Um, we focus this year on redesigning our MTEL prep work for the district and we've gotten some really exciting preliminary information regarding some of our hardest MTELs to take and pass. In the fall we had 20 participants taking our fall MTEL prep and this is these numbers are intentionally small because we're trying to solve a problem. 80% of those candidates, 16, took the M ESL MTEL, 13 passed, with a pass rate of 81% versus a state average of 52%. That's powerful primarily because of many of these individuals have taken and tried to pass this MTEL two, three, four, five times. The most significant impact in this work is that nine of the educators who took the ESL out of this group of 16 were educators of color and eight of them passed. That pass rate is 88%, where the state average for black educators passing is 19%. So when you talk about touch and impact, we have some really explicit information around the curriculum and the, the way these courses are gonna be taught going forward that we're seeing evidence of impact for our most vulnerable and the, one, the educators who've had the hardest time after repeated takes on this particular MTEL. We're seeing evidence of, in our foundations of reading, all the MTELs that both impact our early childhood, our um, ESL, our special ed certifications. And that's something that we've had, and Kim, you know, we've had a major challenge often asking us around how are we supporting our first year teachers or any teachers coming in when we see a barrier to transitioning into the classroom is the MTELs. So I'm feeling really excited about this work, but more importantly, it's not about a touch, is that we have a good, clear system now, and now it's about going to scale with a model that we've seen work with our um, teachers or educators who have the hardest time passing the most complicated MTEL. I, I wanna talk a little, and I wanna bring Amanda down if she can. Amanda leads our recruitment and cultivation team, and we've done a lot of different things, both, as you heard me now, even using the term recruitment and cultivation, the standard recruitment efforts she'll share, but we're also specifically looking at cultivation and coming into different communities and being a presence to mine and cultivate come work in Boston, and this is something you do now, or we will be back next year, and you can also continue to consider us as a place of employment. So I want Amanda to talk a little about the work that we're doing in our recruitment and cultivation team. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Preston Sakari. I'm the director of recruitment for BPS. Um, one of the things that we have done over the past few years is um, along the lines of what you were saying, counselor, shift from a general idea of recruitment to more targeted cultivation. Um, one of the ways that we do this is with our recruitment fellows program. Um, we stipend, currently I have a team of 12 current BPS educators who uh, come from diverse backgrounds and have a range of experience, anywhere from three to 25 years of experience in the classroom. They um, support our team and our team's work in cultivation of candidates uh, so far this year, my recruitment fellows have made personal phone calls to 800 teacher candidates, um, and that includes uh, pre-screening interviews with them. Of those 800, 415 have been flagged as very strong and top priority candidates. Those candidates then get um, even more communication, exclusive invitations to events. Um, they are also, uh, sent directly to school leaders for uh, positions that they may be a good fit for. Um, of those 415, almost 90% of them um, have responded to communications asking for more information on their uh, preferences, their experiences, um, and where they'd like to be so that we can best match 
uh, positions for them. Um, so we are trying to focus and shift focus from this kind of big, broad idea of what recruitment is to really making sure that we're cultivating and finding the best matches for, uh, for the vacancies we have. Excellent. Well, I love this model of recruiting fellows, and that was going to be my question is, are you engaging um, teachers? You know, teachers, you know, who, ha mm -hmm. who, yeah. who have that institutional, you know, memory and that real-time experience who, who know what is going to be required but right. also can, you know, build a supportive community. It's no different than um, having alumni exactly. of any other, uh, right. you know, I endeavor re recruiting who's, who's going to be the next uh, – Absolutely. generation, if you will. So. And one of the things that we've done this year for the first time that we're going to expand and be even more intentional with next year are smaller um, cultivation events. Um, the kind of events that Saren had mentioned earlier are kind of our big recruitment events for the district. Um, but what we've done around the region are smaller um, cultivation-based events for aspiring educators, folks interested in BPS and want to learn more. Um, and we've gotten really positive feedback from that. And so we are going to be utilizing our recruitment fellows and our current educators even more intentionally next year um, to have uh, a lot more of these kind of smaller cultivation regional events um, that don't necessarily feel like your kind of traditional large recruitment event and feel more like getting to know BPS, the district. And so what does that require to continue to do that and to increase capacity? Is this revenue a neutral to do this? Is this just a matter of a, a, a food budget? Is this about, you know, transportation and expenses? Do you have to expand staff? So, you know, how is this uh, outreach happening in cult this recruitment and cultivation in a more meaningful and impactful way and do, with uh, the resources that you currently have? Right. Are they sufficient? You know, who's going to say they have enough in their budget? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But so what, what is the budget? But what I would say <laughs> is that we are intentionally looking at our recruitment fellows, and you would talk about teachers like the alum status, right? Bringing individuals who are closest in the work, recruiting those who need to join us in the work. Um, food budget is always great, um, but it's more around being very strategic about where we do our work and with whom, and who is joining us at what time of year. And so I'm really leaning back on your point around, is it a touch? It's a strategy. And within that strategy, we are looking at making sure that we are canvassing the right neighborhoods and we're bringing the right people to those neighborhoods to communicate with our future educators. Budget. And, and um, then, okay. No, right. no. Do you want me to? I can yes, answer the Yes, and then budget. also because our time is up okay. and for, for this round, but I wanted to also ask: Is a part of your marketing and outreach, um, you know, ethnic and specialty media, you know, radio mm -hmm. and print? Mm -hmm. um, is it social media platforms? Are you doing Facebook ads? You know, how innovative are we being? All of the above. Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, one of the really exciting things we did this year was a completely uh, redesign of a new marketing campaign, the I Teach campaign with BPS using images of our actual teachers on it, and we also had them translated into all of our uh, right. BPS languages. We've used those okay. campaigns in print and online advertisements um, throughout the year, including Spanish language um, newspapers, uh, por uh, the Portuguese Times newspapers, as well as uh, newspapers around the region, um, as well as online similar. And usually you can track that data to see mm -hmm you know, mm -hmm. how many clicks or what was the read rate, right, so you at right. least have that, because otherwise I was going to say, do you ask people when they come to you, how did you learn of, of us, do. so that you can work backwards? Okay, we have a lot of people that are coming off of that ad, so let's continue to do more of that. Are yeah. you able to make those sorts of assessments? We're able to track click rates for the online ads. Okay. Uh, the print ads are a little trickier. We do ask folks when they apply to the district where they heard. Um, but. A, that's self-reported, and B, the most common response of any is other, and so we're not mm. really sure what that, um, is, yeah. what that might mean. Okay. Well, what's different this year is that we are strategic in not having these ads once. They're over a period of the entire um, hiring cycle. Okay. So it's a repeated okay. and intentional. Okay, great. And then the on the budget side? Sure. Um, our budget is on our last slide. Um, the human capital budget increased by about $580,000. That is specifically for a new evaluation platform, um, which is about $200,000 uh, total. We also expanded the Lynch Fellows Program, which is one of the strongest ways that we get our principals um, in BPS. Um, it's been highly subsidized for a number of years. This is the Lynch Leadership Academy through um, Boston College. Um, so we are bearing more of the cost of that. 
Um, we also have, um, there are two tier B positions for payroll and staffing, um, one of which, which was um, bargained through the food and nutrition services uh, contract because of more f frequent paychecks um, for staff there. So we're about, we've maintained, we're, we're a little bit more, um, but I think the, um, what we've been able to do in this, we talked a little bit about how we differentiate our resources, is figure out where they are best spent. Mm -hmm. So we don't have people doing the same thing every year. We say, okay, here's our group of schools. They need more support because the diversity of their staff is lower than average. So this group of people are, is gonna focus in this way with this group. So there is, is there not a specific line item or set aside? For I, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. For yeah. recruitment and cultivation, yeah, there is. what is our spend on okay. that? Yeah. So um, For marketing outreach. Mm -hmm. Uh, so going. my team's total budget, and this excludes um, FTE salaries. This is just the work um, that okay. we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, is one hundred twenty nine thousand okay. seven hundred and fifty dollars, um, and of that, seventy two thousand five hundred are um, is our sorry seventy seven thousand five hundred are stipends for our recruitment fellows. And you said those range from three to 24 or something? What was the number you offered? For oh, the number years. For, oh, for that's for their experience? It, how many are there? Number there are 12. There okay, are 12 okay. recruitment fellows. So I made that number up in my head. Okay. <laughs> right. And how so much 12. is each stipend? Okay. Each, each recruitment fellow is stipended $5,000 for the year okay. um, for the work that they do. We hire them uh, and train them at the end of September, and they work through uh, mid-June. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate the indulgence. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'll set the timer for myself. Chair and vice chair. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to set my, just to be honest here. Um, mm -hmm. with, the, with the resignations, are we asking why teachers are resigning and leaving the department? Um, we, we, we do exit interviews with certain groups. So, for example, principals, we do exit interviews with everyone. Um, it's a small group. Um, Office of Equity has done exit interviews with, yeah. do you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, so last year, um, the Office of Equity attempted to contact every um, educator of color who left the district to ask them questions about why and, and any to see if we could have any learnings. Um, and what we found was they weren't very eager to speak with us. We made multiple calls mm -hmm. to each person. I think. You know, there can be a variety of reasons for that. Somebody retired and they are off with their grandchildren or in Hawaii. Well, or retirement whatever. is different than uh, resignation. resignation. Yeah, right. we were looking at every exit. But, you know, again, if somebody resigns and they rent to a new district, do they necessarily want to call back the Office of Equity? Anyway, so we made multiple calls to every person, but we had a very, very low response rate. And so the results. Um, aren't particularly useful, unfortunately. We were hoping we were hoping to get some rich data from that, but it was not effective. Great, um, thank you. I, I wish that we could get more of that information because yeah, I think too. it could inform some mm -hmm. of the work, especially around cultivation, mm -hmm. um, right? And you know, sort of what the educator in particular is feeling yeah. and why they're leaving. Why they're leaving. But then I think it's also important information to talk about stress levels and sort of the impact of this career right. on individuals because yeah. if they're leaving the career altogether, that's much more concerning to me right. than them just going to a different school district, sure. perhaps for a new opportunity. Um, and speaking, I think, of cultivation and professionalism, the Lynch Leadership Fellowship, you just mentioned that it was where subsidizing a portion of the tuition for the, so the students are, their our yeah. teachers, our administrators yep. that are going into this program. Can we talk about the breakdown and who's paying for how much of it? Sure, and actually um, Lynch, the Lynch Foundation has been paying for all of it up until last year where we, um, where the MOU that we had signed about four years ago kind of gradually increased how much Boston Public Schools pays. Um, so to, we have typically around five or six um, Lynch Leadership Fellows. They're usually current BPS teachers who go through their rigorous screening process. Um, and then once they're selected, their salary is paid for a full year. They're placed with a mentor, um, so they get um, in, uh, in, in job embedded coaching. They also go through the professional development at um, Boston College. So in the past, um, the Lynch Foundation, we had, had been paid, paid for both the professional development at Boston College and the salary of the, individually, of the individual. Um, that amount has increased um, the part that we bear um, this year. Um, so for example, 
uh, average salaries we use in district. $90,000 is the average salary for one of these individuals. Um, last year we paid 45,000, Lynch paid 45,000. Next year we'll pay the full 90,000 for the salary. And so, now we're up to 96, I think for the average. For the average, so we will pay whatever the average is, okay. yes. And then the Lynch Foundation is separate from Boston College? They are separate, yeah. And, and is Boston College, because this is through Boston College affiliated with them, are they covering any of the cost? I do not believe that Boston College pays anything. No. Nope. Um, okay. So are we also getting, creating, cultivating our leadership from any other programs other than the Lynch? How, how yep. I guess, let me rephrase the question. Gotcha. How, does our, how do our teachers and administrators and staff feel about their uh, level of professionalism if they are trained in a different program? How do they, if they're... Are they a priority applicant if they are trained through a different program? Um, priority applicant for being a school leader in Boston Public mm -hmm. Schools. Um, we run, everybody goes through the same process um, in uh, BPS for once they want to become a school leader. Um, so there is not specifically a preference given. Our major, uh, our major um, sources of candidates are our own aspiring principals program, which is internal. Um, Lynch Fellows, which I just described. We have a new school turnaround program partnership with UVA, but that's new, so that, that hasn't um, entered into the equation. We have a partnership with UMass Boston yeah. um, where individuals get their administrator license, and that is a very strong program. So I would say that those are probably our four mm -hmm. top. Yeah, the, the, the program that we have in partnership with UMass Boston, bless you, um, offers educational administration and principal certification, and it is intended for our, it's only for our BPS employees. It's held on Saturdays with that intentionality, given that people are in different roles. Um, we've had 52 individuals in the first three cohorts. We're in our third cohort now. 79% um, of the educators who've done that are, were educators of color, 52% black, 21% Latinx. 31% um, of the individuals were male, and of those males, 56% were black, and 19 Latino. We had our first graduating class in June, 90% graduated on time with their certification. And we also have, as you all know, we have a male educators of color executive coaching program to develop our male educators of color and our women's educators of color executive coaching program. We've Are we had, subsidizing any of those programs? Yes, the cost of, it's not us, but UMass has been incredibly generous with their um, the master's program. It is, an, it is um, an incredibly affordable rate. It's under 14,000. And so who's paying for that? The educators pay the 14,000, um, which is a considerable discount on the cost for a master's program. And we host the, the program on our campus at the bowling building. The, and, the male educators of color and, and women's educators of color executive program, there's no cost to any of the um, individuals that attend those programs. And, and, and who are those covered by the expense of those programs? The, the district? Our, the district. our office Great. manages but that But UMass cost. Boston is paying. Yeah, they've, um, they've done a really amazing job of providing a, um, a, an affordable rate and a tuition for that. Great. How many, um, how many employees does BPS have? Uh, current number. I say 11,000, but I can give you the... Uh, Approximately 11,592. 11, um, how many of them are teachers? Um, 4,400 are teachers. Mm -hmm. And are teachers, all of those teachers in classrooms? Um, if you are... Yeah, they are, yes, they are, all in, uh, they are all in classrooms. There might be some, Anissa, who are... Um, like an en enrollment specialist, some mm -hmm. BTU members who would be um, covered in that 4,400, but the vast majority are in classrooms. How, um, how many of our 11,600 employees are required to fulfill the Boston residency program or requirement? Um, the, the, many of the unions have bargained out that requirement, and that's about, um, uh, let me get my numbers right. Of the 11,000, the numbers in, so the managerial employees are the group that would most likely be 
um, covered under the residency requirement. Um, and that is approximately 800, I'm looking at John, around 800 managerial. Um, but within that group, um, there's a number of managerial employees who are covered by the state statute that exempts, um, I'll put quotes around it, the state statute says employees in the line of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, so that number is probably around, do you guys have a number for me? 300 or 400 who are in that line, depending on how you define it. So in the line of instruction to me means classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. So we have 400 managerial um, positions that are exempt from Boston residency. Yeah, so this is, we, we are working on this and we're pouring through all the job codes. Um, it, so let yeah. me just, you so I, yes. you can, if you can get us that information, Absolutely. that would be, um, that I think is, incredibly important information. Yeah. Um, I think that it's really important, and I'll, uh, this is my opinion, yeah. that our employees live in the city in the of city. Boston. And when we have a number of managerial positions that are not classroom teachers, that are making on the highest end, I would salaries. say, of the salary spectrum, yeah. not required to live in the city of Boston, yeah. that's a problem for me. And I'm most interested in um, the uh, we have one superintendent, I do know he lives in the city of Boston, but our chiefs, our executive superintendents, our assistant superintendents, our deputy superintendents, yep. that as those on the highest end of the payroll spectrum, we yep. talk about budget, we're spending the most amount of money on them, that they are living in the city of Boston, mm -hmm. um, that is very, very important to me. Yep. Um, and second to that is managerial folks that are not in the classroom, claiming that state exemption. Okay. We can get you that data. Right. And then my last question is, how many um, teachers do we have on leave right now for um, disciplinary investigations? Yeah, those are um, primarily handled through our Office of Labor Relations. I do not have that data. I will get that for you. I'm, I'm interested in how many are currently on leave and yep. how much that is costing the district, yep. what the average length of leave is, yep. um, and sort of what the process is of reintroducing those teachers and, and right. staff back into our buildings if yep. the findings are, um, if there are no found, findings found. Yep. Um, and then if there are findings found, what are they? And um, okay. what are we doing about it? Sure. Great. That's the um, Great. that was my clock for me. Thank Council you, Council Janey. Great. Um, so you mentioned that most of the teachers are in classrooms. Yeah. Is there still the suitable professional capacity teachers? Yep. If so, how many teachers are classified as that, and how much is that costing? Sure. So currently, we have fifty-six teachers um, who are in suitable professional capacity. Um, positions. That means every single one of them is in the classroom. They are co-teaching. Um, in some cases, in other cases, they do have full caseloads. Just saw one um, recently, full caseloads of, teach of students. Um, the budget for um, the SPC line um, is currently, for FY19, uh, is 7.1 million. Um, Seven? 7.1. Okay, and how many employees uh, does your office have, Emily? Um, we have approximately 45 FTEs on our roster, our teachers who, on, who are on uh, leaves of absences that are not disciplinary, um, as well as the SPC um, teachers, but about 45 are full-time employees of, of OHC. Okay, 45 uh, OHC employees, mm -hmm. FTEs. Um, and what's the diversity of your office? We are um, over 50% people, people of color. I don't have the exact number, probably around 55. Mm -hmm. What languages are represented? Within OHC. Mm -hmm. um, we have native Spanish speakers. Um, we have a native Arabic speaker, um, native, uh, a French speaker. Mm -hmm. um, who else do you know? I don't have any more. Okay, I, could I appreciate list. that. Um, down to the school level, when uh, principals, so in the last round of questions, you assured me that principals and school site councils yep. were still very much an mm -hmm. active part mm -hmm. of the hiring process. 
what kind of training are they getting to, you know, recognize the, the best candidates? What kind of training are they getting to um, hire black and Latino teachers? What's what's happening at the school level, and who's supporting that? And is that through your office? Yep, sure. Is that a joint venture with the BTU? Still, yeah, so or? that's uh, primarily a joint venture of the Office of Equity and the Office of Human Capital. Our diversity focus schools have <coughs> mandatory training where they must send at least one person who is leading hiring efforts for their school to a training um, that is very much focused on increasing specifically the number of black and Latino uh, teachers and that are hired each year. And we've added a component this year for the first time of specific um, strategies for retention. So not only does that training cover uh, how to select uh, black and Latino teachers and, and why that's important, but it also covers how to retain the teachers mm -hmm. once they come into your building and what are some strategies that school leaders can use to ensure that uh, t new teachers will stay. Um, we also did some training work this year with the instructional superintendents because they tend to be sort of day-to-day -day in partnership with school leaders. So we did some training with them, a very similar training session to the one I just described. So they're also familiar with why we value black and Latino teachers in particular and what kinds of interventions work to ensure that the results of our hiring processes are what we want to right. see them And to as be. you guys already know, um, you know, this is... I think a very important strategy for closing opportunity and achievement mm -hmm. gaps, which is why we agreement. spend so much time and, and have these hearings. Absolutely. Um, is that, so you say that there are trainings happening, are they also being held accountable? Is it in the job description? Is it in the evaluation? Is there a line in, in evaluations around hiring diverse um, teachers? In the evaluation of yes, principals. Yes, there is. We're also in the middle of a revamp of the principal eval to be more specific because it's been in there. But and we as want well it to as be the more assistant superintendents who are then right. supervising all the way up. Yes. Principals. Yeah. Um, I want to say one other thing is we talked about the diversity focus schools initiative. Um, we also focus on specifically nine low performing schools who may or may not be um, in the low diversity group or not, but they get specific training on setting up your school site personnel. Council, sorry, school site council, personnel subcommittee. Um, they get training on how to run an effective hiring process because what we see in some of those schools is that one of the reasons they are low performing is because they do not hire well. They don't hire early, they don't hire diversely, they don't hire strong teachers. So that's a specific intervention. Coming back to the diversity focus schools, it's the combination of those that have the largest gap between the diversity of the students with the teachers as well as openings. Exactly. So how many schools have the, the lack of diversity but maybe not the openings because they retain their teachers? So I'm wondering how many schools would fall into that category but are not getting support from your office? I don't know the answer, but um, could, I'm sure we could get that to you. That but what I would great. say is that um, it, all of our schools are getting uh, intervention of some sort in the sense that, for example, um, our school leaders are participating in professional development around culturally and linguistically sustaining practices like that, that in an intensive way. So um, while the diversity focus schools resources are just that, they are honing in on those approximately 20 schools a year that fit that criteria. Um, there is no school leader who's been untouched by this work. Okay. Um, back to the SPC teachers. Mm -hmm. So 56 teachers, mm -hmm. they're all in classrooms. Yep. Uh, how many, so we expect that all of these, so where are they in terms of their um, evaluation ratings? Are they going yep. to have their own classroom one day? Is that the goal, to get them into their own classroom? And what is the diversity? of yep. this pool. So the goal is always to um, not have teachers in SPC, to reduce that right. number. Sometimes that happens through exits, either through evaluation or through somebody resigning, because in many of these cases, like I've said, they only have one license and it's in business services or something that is not um, a high need. Um, and when they are strong, we want them hired as soon as possible. So we started the year with about 100 on the first day of school and we're down to 56. Okay. The data on and why. Can you get the, diver the diversity sure. data to me? Yep. And I just want to tell you, they, the, the teachers who have exited um, this year, 18 were hired, 
13 resigned. So this is from September to last month. Of how the number got down to 56. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, one retired. We also um, had a, in partnership with the, the Boston Teachers Union, we off, offer a voluntary severance agreement where a teacher can take a lump sum mm -hmm. and index of the system. About seven people did that this year. Um, and then there's a couple who are on leave of absence, which they can't, you know, they can't get hired during that and time. And if you could get that data to us, I sure. think that would be really helpful. Yeah. I want to kind of related switch to the retirement, resignation, sure. and dismissal. Yep. I'm interested in um, how, how that broke down. How many were mm -hmm. retirements overall, looking at all teachers? Yeah, how I many were that. retirements versus resignation? versus dismissal and layoff, and then if you could also break that down by race. Sure, all right, let me sign my exits that I had earlier, apologize. Exit, you see the word exit? Oh, is it my there? <laughs> um, so was I on three, 392 exits, right, total? There we go. Um, okay, so exits, 392 was the total. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Janey, uh, if I go through, we had um, 89 were retirements, 186 were resignations, 70 um, were provisional contracts that weren't renewed, 35 were layoffs, 8 were dismissals, 1 was death. Oh, God. And so that should add up. And then there 17 was other. Wonderful. So the resignation is pretty high uh, yep. compared to the other buckets. And um, as Councillor Asabi George already mentioned, it'd be very right. helpful to understand why why that is. Um, I would also like to see those buckets broken down by race, if you could provide that mm -hmm. um, at a later time. Sure. I wanted to come back to, so there are a couple of bright spots uh, to, to highlight. Um, one was the retention of 82% of the provisionals, yep. which is good to see. Um, increasing in linguistic diversity from 35% to 41%. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, and some of these areas, MTEL prep, you know, that's been around for a while. I'm glad that you've had the success this year, but I think we've known for quite some time what works, MTEL prep, mm -hmm. kind of building the pipeline, right. and, you know, the, the frustration, I think, is um, it's just because of the urgency yep. of this. And so it, it feels like we are celebrating things, successes that we know could work, that we knew, you know, five years before. ago. You know, 10 years ago, like open postings. We, mm -hmm. That was back in the 2000 contract. Mm -hmm. We got that. Um, so, you know, I'd like to see as much as possible um, more intentionality around moving forward on what does work so that we can really get to the shared goals that we all have, including the Boston School Committee, which is having the teaching staff reflect the diversity of our student body. Currently, you know, 38% educators of color versus 86% uh, student body. So, um, I'm sure we'll continue to have conversation. I know others continue to have questions, so I will yield my time. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Thank you. I apologize for sure. being late. I had a scheduling conflict, so I won't reinvent the wheel. I was going to come in and say, can you please start over? But <laughs> I figured I wouldn't do that. Uh, I just have uh, really two questions, uh, areas of focus. One, the PPS nurses. I'm really happy that we're adding uh, more. Um, but from the nurses that I have talked to, uh, they are very concerned about the family resource centers. Yeah. Um, kids coming in, no forms, no records, uh, tremendous Larry, uh, language barriers uh, at the uh, registration. Uh, the data entry uh, isn't very solid. Uh, is there a way we can address that? Uh, because I know uh, from a person who ran camps for a long, long time, you know, you can't get into a YMCA camp right. without all your forms in order, yet you can sit next to 20 two other people with your forms not correct for 180 days, so it's yeah. an issue. Yeah, yeah, I talk, we have a monthly meeting with the BTU leadership and this has come up there um, for all kinds of reasons, so I agree it needs to be addressed. 
don't know if anybody has anything to add. I don't. I, 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 I will just reaffirm that that is very important, and I, we don't have a solution yet, but we, um, it's risen to us from them. Okay. All right. So you're working on it. Yeah. Got it. All right. Uh, the second, if you could dive in a little bit to um, uh, the City Connects program. Uh, in particular, uh, the Bates School in my district is losing uh, a beloved teacher. Uh, in fact, they've got a GoFundMe page right. going on now trying to it's raise uh, money for Mr. Prisby. Um, I know that the Bates isn't considered a, a high need school, um, but as they move towards inclusion, um, Mr. Prisby is becoming uh, really an integral part of, of their community. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get money back into that line, or, or how can we fund those positions? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, the <clears throat> the partnership dollars this year in, in the Boston Public Schools were reallocated. In the past, and that's, and City Connects is one of our external partners. Mm -hmm. In the past, those dollars uh, were being allocated uh, based on relationships. Hey, uh, hey, somebody at City Year knows so-and-so at this school, can we come to your school? Oh, sure, that sounds good, City Connect, oh, whatever. So it was based on people knowing each other, legacy relationships. We wanted to apply a lens of equity to our partnership dollars, and this was really the last corner of the Boston Public Schools budget where there was not a deliberate formula to ensure both fairness and equity in how the partnership dollars were being allocated. And so I was part of a working group along with folks from the Budget Office, Opportunity and Achievement Gap Office, and others to look at how we could do two things at the same time. First, allocate those dollars in a way that made more sense in terms of both fairness and equity. And second, give schools the discretion to select the partners that they felt would be most helpful given their particular students' needs. In the past, as I said, it was a more informal connections kind of relationship versus a particular school saying, City Connects is the program we want. We have X number of partnership dollars, and City Connects, we feel, would be the most effective partner to use those dollars for. So as a result of that reallocation of funds and the autonomy that we gave schools, and I should also add that the Partnerships Office um, that was also integrally involved with this effort went through a vetting process where they reviewed all of the partner organizations and ensured that we were offering up partners who had been effective and met certain standards for the district. So it was really a three-prong effort, the reallocation of dollars, the vetting of partners, and the uh, addition of autonomy for our schools and self-selecting partners. So as a result of that, some of our schools increased their partnership dollars, some decreased. Some got partnership dollars for the first time after never having them before, um, et cetera. So um, I think that overall this is a really exciting step for the district. And as happens when you have um, limited resources, not everyone's going to gain. But, uh, but I do believe it's uh, a great step for us. And I can s speak specifically to your question about the Bates. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just looking at my screen since I have information um, <laughs> from last night. Uh, the funding for the counselor position has been restored um, in large part due to additional funding from the district. Um, so that is relatively new information. Um, so Mr. That Prisby I, stays? That, that's what this, yes. We'll have some yes. very happy Phineas Bates Foxes. <laughs> great. <laughs> Breaking news, I guess. Okay, yeah. great. Oh, <laughs> she's looking up there going, did I just... <laughs> No, I'm good. looking. I'm looking You're at my go. CFO, but I got All the right. okay. <laughs> All right. Great. No, I'm good. That's uh, that. That school's an awesome school. Yep. So I, um, wow, that was that was easy. You guys are the best. <laughs> I, I we just a quick follow, a follow up to that. Where did the money come from? That is the, the level of detail I have. Either Ellen or that's all we have right now. It says from the district in the in the email I have. Okay, maybe we'll get it in a resubmittal or something like that. Okay. Uh, Councillor Presley. Um, thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I just wanted to uh, ask about the uh, second annual Emerging Best Practices Preventing and Addressing Bias-Based Incidents in Schools. Um, are those incidents defined by student behavior or for total school culture? 
Yeah, so the conference um, drew over 200 educators from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Okay, so this is question. us. This is the Boston Public Schools Office of Equity sharing out our best practices. Um, and it, the conference originated when, um, after we uh, were in the news regarding Boston Latin School, districts began contacting us saying, we hear you know how to do this. We hear you've learned a lot about how to prevent and address bias-based incidents. And we, frankly, don't have the time to answer every one of those calls and, and be consultants to all the other districts. So it was that that inspired us to organize this conference. And um, we've been lucky to have support from uh, multiple sponsors, including this year we were particularly excited to have a grant from Teaching Tolerance, um, which is part of the Southern Poverty Law Center, for our conference and to have their director be one of our keynote speakers. Um, so the conference is aimed at preventing any form of bias in schools. So that would be a student-to-student -student incident, an employee-to-student incident, a student-to-employee. Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. So does that include discipline? What do you mean? <clears throat> Biases uh, resulting in a, a disproportionate ah. uh, out-of-classroom time. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and okay. this is a, an issue that within Boston Public Schools we are working on every day okay. in multiple ways, um, uh, looking at the data and, and trying to interpret what they mean, figuring out alternatives to um, out of school suspension, um, increasing the use of restorative justice. So we have 26 schools this year that have restorative justice programs for the first time. Um, and the Office of Equity is absolutely supporting all of those efforts. Okay, great. And I just wanted to, um, so thank you for clarifying that. And um, uh, if you do not already have it, uh, I will make sure that my office gets you a copy of our recommendations from our partnership with the National Black Women's Justice Institute mm -hmm. to specifically address push out um, that is happening in all Boston area schools. So this is not just a charter problem or, yes. you know, it, it, for all the schools. We did evidence-based research um, with 100 black and Latina girls who we paid, we stipended to do this research. And um, and they, they just talked about how they were, they were feeling. And a lot of the out-of-classroom time had to do with dress code. Hmm. Yeah, so. And, and so to me, that's some really low hanging fruit mm -hmm. and so um, if you don't have the report we can make sure you get a hard copy before you leave here okay. Ronald please confer with Lenise to make that happen mm -hmm. uh, we can send it electronically as well our recommendations um, and I know that uh, BPS wants to be a partner in the implementation of these uh, and some of them will require a change through school committee. But for those things that you have the immediate autonomy to address, I'm just underscoring the need and asking for your, your partnership. Okay. Yeah, right. I have read the report and I thank you. Oh, thank for, you. I, I thank you for your work and I thank the students for their oh, work. Thank you for participating and, too. And, and I've been part of conversations to figure out what our top priorities are in terms of implementation of um, some excellent ideas that are there. Um, I will say that last year, the Office of Equity issued a model dress code policy that is gender neutral. Okay. And that is part of what is needed in order to avoid dress code violations as a source of discipline. Okay. Um, there are multiple ways to try to uh, mitigate those disciplinary actions, but one of them is by having a gender neutral code. Okay. All right, great. Um, and just, uh, is hair policy a part of, uh, is that... In, there is in no, writing anywhere? If you look at the um, model dress code, there is nothing there regarding hair. But the only concerns we have about hair, there are often rules around head coverings that are gender neutral rules. And then, of course, safety. You know, if a student is involved mm -hmm. with athletics and certain sports, you may need to put your hair in an elastic, whether you're male or female, okay. or, or gender nonconforming. Okay, and then I, you know, I, this is um, uh, Councilor Sabi George participated in the uh, listening only hearing that we have with a number of girls who have participated um, in our evidence based research and um, a number of the black Muslim girls especially uh, spoke about uh, their experiences and wearing their hijabs and mm -hmm. um, and they had also just uh, so I wanted to just ask in terms of a teacher training 
Um, is there a cultural competency specifically in that regard? Because we're sort of saying that we know folks don't mean any harm, but even with our male teachers sometimes, how they are relating to us um, is, is not comfortable and in keeping with our religious practices. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure that that is a part of the professional development mm -hmm. and the cultural yeah. competency. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. the other uh, question that had been raised, and I know this gets very difficult, you know, because you don't want to set a precedent, but um, they had raised uh, about safe places for prayer. Um, yes. uh, is this something that can be addressed or that you are discussing? Yeah, absolutely. So the Office of Equity is responsible for responding to all requests for religious accommodations in the district, and that includes our employees as well, of our, as, well as our students and families. Okay. And any student or family or employee that requests a quiet, clean, private place to pray in the Boston Public School building will be provided with that. Um, is there a designated place that just exists that people know, or is it like a case by case? It's totally case by case okay. because depending on the circumstances of the of that particular school and that particular school building, different um, accommodations will work in different cases. But it, those requests will always be met. Okay, and then on the specific point around what the black Muslim girls were sharing in their mm -hmm. testimony, what can be done about that? Yeah, we are continuing to do cultural competence work in the district on a wide variety of issues, and this is one of them. And in fact, just yesterday, um, <coughs> our, our team was reviewing, um, we got some excellent suggestions around ensuring that our uh, school employees are aware of the implications of Ramadan, which is starting very shortly this year, um, and making sure that, for example, um, that there's some thoughtfulness around the scheduling of, of MCAS in terms of lining up with when students um, may be fasting. Excellent. So we are absolutely th thinking about those issues very actively day to day. And then I guess I was just missing the, the slide on the gender breakdown for our educators. Um, you know, it's just my old eyes here. I see all the slides on race, and we've been deep diving on that. And I, and I know uh, Councillor Janey had referenced, uh, you know, specifically uh, uh, the cohort program around male uh, teachers of color. Uh, but obviously that was created to address what is a gender uh, disparity. So do we have that breakdown in terms of male, female? I do. I just yeah. got asked this question it? earlier. 75% um, of our teachers are female and 25% of our teachers are male. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And then um, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act uh, prompts me to, to ask a question that, Pregnant workers. Yeah. you know, we've been able to do... Um, I've seen in some charters, and I, the whole point of charters was to, you know, if there are things that we can replicate, best practices. And so when we talk about teacher retention, you know, one of the things that I see, especially for our younger teachers, um, is that we, they're, when they uh, become pregnant, um, it is very tough uh, to get them uh, back after they've given birth to that child. And you know that's not, you know that's a problem in the workforce period. But I hear it more from young teachers. I wanted to keep teaching. My, so you know there are some uh, charter schools have um, made it possible to have on-site childcare um, as a way to retain uh, their young teachers, and uh, you know who are raising a family and you know have a lot more years of service that they want to give to the system but childcare is a real issue it's not so much a a conflict about do i want to be a stay at home mom or i want to it's it's the issue of childcare so i just wonder if this is something that would in any way be fiscally sustainable or possible is it something that's been discussed i'm not aware of any okay. conversations about that but i would certainly love to be at the table to explore that okay all right, um, and then my last question is um, on page six, the bullet that says partnering with BLS to implement year two of DOJ resolution agreement. What is that? So uh, at the time that we originally received an influx of concerns from students at Boston Latin School, um, a group of advocates went to the US uh, Department of Justice requesting an external investigation into what had occurred. Okay. And um, at that time, um, the U.S. Attorney investigated Boston Latin School, and in the end, they found that there was one incident of all those that had been brought forward that um, 
was in particular should have been handled differently as a result of that. So this was not a legal conclusion. There was no finding, a legal finding against Boston Latin School, but it was an observation that was made by the department. And as a result, we entered into a consent agreement with the Department of Justice that essentially requires us to do the same work the Office of Equity is doing in every other school, and plus a few additional things. So um, the part that's common to all of our schools, including Boston Latin, is that we're working close, we're training all of our administrators, we're training our students around equity protocols, we're giving parents opportunities to learn about equity protocols. We're partnering with our school administrators when incidents occur to make sure that they are addressed sufficiently and comprehensively. Some of the pieces that are a little bit different at Boston Latin School um, include uh, deeper uh, work around cultural competence that's mandatory for all faculty, um, and an annual uh, racial and ethnic climate audit by external auditors for a total of three years. Okay. So we are now near completion of year two of the three-year agreement with the Department of Justice. And in all respects, we have met those requirements and exceeded them in many areas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has there been a decision yet on the new headmaster appointment for Boston Latin Academy? We got that in front of My the most station. recent update was that was imminent. It has not been announced yet. Okay, so I think that the recommendation was made from the selection committee, perhaps the first, the end, second week of April. And then if that, the process is that it then goes to the superintendent, so that's <coughs> where it is right now. Okay. Um, the evaluation platform that's part of the the additional investment for FY19, yep. what are we investing in? Um, so we currently have our homegrown one that we built. Um, the one that we are, we went through the RFP process that we're using is called, is it Teachscape? It has a version of that name. Um, it's, uh, I think it's called Teachscape and it's a purchased program that will fit the Massachusetts regs. Great, mm -hmm. and then what's the current completion rate on it? on evaluations? Um, you let me pull it up. It's around 98%. So it depends on if we're doing. Um, uh, so overall, teacher completion was 90.4%. That's from school year 26, 2017, since that's complete. Um, for teachers, we were at 95 for principals. And that's up from, because I think last year it was maybe about 84% completion. Actually, the one I, I have 93% the year before from teachers. Um, so I had 80, so going back five years, 85, 79, <coughs> 94, 93, 90. Okay, that's maybe it's an initial mm -hmm. earlier yeah. one. And then what about our work around training, um, you know, thinking about the hiring process, thinking about yeah. developing and cultivating future teachers. Um, talk to me a little bit about the work around training paras and perhaps even substitutes yeah. who are already connected to our um, schools. That would be individuals coming in either through our BPS teaching fellowship or most likely through our BPS accelerated community teacher program. And I had shared earlier the BPS teaching fellowship is an initiative that this as the state has granted us permission to be able to give initial licensure. So in some cases, it's our pairs coming in and also in, into our subs. But in most cases, because of our pairs being full-time BPS educators, most people enter through our accelerated community teacher program. And it's because it's Saturday sessions and the folks can also be in the classroom and also continue their learning in the, on Saturdays. And then do they, they required at that point to already have a bachelor's? Yep, the bachelor's degree is a, is a base. And throughout the 12-month the program, they get MTEL support and their, their pedagogy and practice with um, existing mentor teachers that are BPS employees and teachers. And when I think about diversity and I think about hiring local, um, yeah. can we talk a little bit about uh, what we're maybe doing in our schools? And this is a planted question mm -hmm. for you, Sarah. <laughs> but how are we promoting the profession with our students? Yeah. Well, as you might have heard yesterday, um, <laughs> We have an existing high school teacher program, and, and Anissa is smiling only because she and I worked on that uh, a similar program um, a couple years back. But we continue to do so. We recruit our high school students um, to become educators. We recruit also high school mentors that are both educators and 
guidance or in other roles in the district. Um, the most exciting thing for us going forward is our partnership with City Air, where we're partnering with City Air and UMass Boston to not only get our kids excited in their high school years, but prepare a really clear path for them to pursue an undergraduate degree at an affordable cost and connect with UMass Boston to pursue a graduate degree at, at, at no cost at all, at debt free. The City Year Partnership gives our students a, a year, a gap year between <coughs> high school and college for them to double down and focus on what content and also what grade level. And as they graduate from um, undergrad, we continue to connect with them throughout their undergraduate year. So you will see a lot of our high school to teacher students as they pursue the City Year, Teach Boston City Year pathway in and around Boston Public Schools in the summer doing internships and, and just generally learning how to continue to be a great educator. And then do we have, this is my very last question, um, do we have a idea when we talk about recruitment, what, what are we spending per recruit? Like what's that average spend? What's that mm -hmm. investment to get I mean, per teacher that we bring in from the outside. Yeah. So this summer, we you might have an answer in your head. Mm -hmm. This summer, we are hoping to do a return on investment study mm -hmm. um, with an Ed Pioneer fellow for this reason. I don't know if you have an estimate I don't already. have a, a specific, and I'm looking up, at Amanda, do you have a dollar? I don't think we have a dollar figure per individual bringing in. We'll You have to come to the mic. Amanda. That's all right. We can also yeah. get this. I mean, that's, yeah. I, mean, I think it's really interesting to, to do that. Yeah. I'll be interested in that return, yeah. the ROI study. We're going to be doing because that. Because I for think that we're going to find some correlations between how much cultivation and, and I think in the end how much we're spending right. to recruit those teachers. But I also think in uh, retaining teachers, that, yeah. that retention piece is really important. And if yeah. we had a better understanding, of why teachers are leaving, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that can help us spend yeah. wiser on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that one of the things that we do well is provide opportunities for professional growth and development for our educators. So you heard, you mentioned um, the master's program, that's one option. But we also in our office have opportunities for f teachers to be mentors to new teachers. So our BPS Teaching Fellowship, we recruited six amazing educators to work with us in the summer as coaches. So I, I agreed, I think there's one side of the ledger is figuring out why folks leave, and the other side is to continue to provide options for folks to see themselves developing and growing in Boston Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And so those, are, those are high school teacher mentors are individuals who want to do something different and see that as a place of growth and supporting our future educators. Well, I think it also though loops back to um, just generally our, our professionalism that mm -hmm. we treat our teachers Absolutely. with. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it also ties back to conversations around that DSPC pool mm -hmm. and how um, those teachers, and I'd say most of them are more veteran teachers, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, what their experience is, especially, you know, towards the, you know, into the second half of their career, mm -hmm. the messages that that creates the for the future teachers, both young teachers maybe in the same building, but then right. also our kids who are thinking about that profession because I think right. it, having having happy and professionally fulfilled teachers in the classroom will help grow yep. that career and I think with that line I'll just mention that one of my high school teachers happens to be in the room uh, Ms. Cheney so I'm always in my best behavior oh. behavior when she's here oh. Good so, job. Um, <laughs> so that's that that's and, awesome. and actually I'll just say it because I, I mentioned it to someone this morning I had an opportunity um, to a, attend a teacher event uh, where Ms. Cheney was and then one of my former students was also there who's wow. now a BPS teacher. So when we create yeah, those generations, generations of, Absolutely. of teaching, I think that's, um, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, creating the appropriate culture for teachers in which to perform at that high expectation and, and high personal fulfillment yep. will help with that retention and also growth and um, life of the profession as a whole. Right. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Council Janie. Any um, so yeah, just I guess in parting, I, I won't go on. I'm yeah. really, uh, I have additional questions around uh, retention and um, wondering if 
you have seen a reduction in the number. I know there were a lot of teachers who were of retirement age, mm -hmm. particularly uh, teachers of color, black teachers mm -hmm. specifically, that were leaving the system. Has that right. slowed down any? Um, and yeah, yeah. So we had a, a good year, in quotes, last year. But in, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what it is, and um, I'll tell you the numbers. Um, but we also know that a lot of this is, dim is driven by demographics. So we can do things to make a difference. Um, but uh, but we just know that the that there's a large group of teachers of color who are who are kind of at that brink, um, and we did have a reduction in the number of sorry I want to give you the exact number um, of uh, for example between October 2016 and October uh, 2017. Um, and this is specifically around black educators who exited the system. In 2016, we had 110 black educators exit, and then in October 2017, we had only 56 black um, educators exit. The corresponding numbers for Latino um, educators, 51 2016, uh, down about 10% to 46 in October of 2017. Um, so those are specifically for, um, for ex all exits um, so, so there's a positive um, number there. Um, I can't, and, and I think that I know this is because this is exits. I know that our MIOC and WIOC and mm -hmm. other retention programs are um, having a positive influence. However, um, we also know that demographics right. drive this. And next year, I'm not sure that the numbers. I don't know where the numbers will lie. Yeah. So I, I have uh, several additional questions, but I think I am hosting. Uh, a mm -hmm. hearing on teacher diversity specifically, where I really hope that we can dive in, not just around the hiring and recruitment piece, which is critically important, yeah. but really that support, that development, um, mm -hmm. making sure that teachers you know, feel supported and, and welcomed, <clears throat> that we are not creating hostile environments in, in the workplace, um, that they have you know, the ear of their school leader. Right. Um, so I'd like to kind of, you know, I want to mm -hmm. get into the pipeline, mm -hmm. obviously, but um, I have other commitments, and so I think I will defer until that hearing, okay. Okay. if that's okay, and sure. would probably like the three of you yeah. all to be in attendance. I love so that's there. it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Council Janney. Council Presley. <clears throat> I was just wondering, uh, to that point, in terms of retention and climate, um, you know, I remember one of the hearings that, uh, that I sponsored around improving transitions for students receiving special education services. And one of the moms from SPEDPAC said, you know, inclusion isn't a seat at the table, it's an experience, mm -hmm. right? And so in terms of that experience, and to Councilor Janie's point, it being one that is more uh, supportive, I just wonder if you've ever considered a, an adult model of the posse program. Mm -hmm. where people, where folks will be onboarded in a cohort, uh, not to create any sort mm -hmm. of um, separate, you know, mm -hmm. you know, subculture of a community, um, but just um, I think it, it could go a long way so that folks don't feel like a one-off or isolated mm -hmm. and all of the new experiences they're having together, there's that common experience. Well, when we had this last year, um, we had six of our BPS teaching fellows were at the Ellis, or at the Ellis right okay. now. And I think that one place, one environment, multiple experiences, and one of our existing uh, full-time coaches supporting them for the year. And the outcome is really strong. We have, as the life of any of the six teachers, we had five of those teachers will be re returning next year, and one will be choosing to, uh, is applying for other positions. Um, but their experience, I think they will say that they have made friends for life. Um, and having the first year together, having all of them um, being in one community with their same coach. Um, we had dinner with, I had dinner with them three weeks ago. Um, and it, uh, they're a group of multiracial um, educators at the Ellis, who I would say that they would have a lot to say about their experience. And a lot of it has to do about the value of the cohort. Um, again, remember school leaders select. so. We were heavily in, um, um, sharing these candidates as opportunities, and so this particular school leader took on the challenge, and, and yeah, so we had a small cohort there. And yeah, it was a, yeah, they smile. All I will leave that is that, you know, they have had an experience together, um, 
and they valued their peers and also their coach as being someone that. So kind is, of is this it. something that we plan to replicate? We will make every effort to continue to have school leaders see the value of um, hiring one or two or three of our cohorts members in one building. Yeah, because okay. they come with a coach. Okay, great. Um, and then just getting back to school culture and climate, um, both for educators and students. What is the current process if someone feels um, threatened, uncomfortable, um, you know, either uh, discrimination or sexual harassment, um, you know, a racial epithet or slur, you know, are all the students educated about what it is their right to do? or only the 200 that maybe came to a conference. I just want to make sure that everyone knows it is what their rights are and then Absolutely. how to activate the process. Yeah, so the Office of Equity um, conducts very systematic training and education programs to ensure that our students, our families, and our employees are aware of equity protocols. Uh, we have information about equity protocols, for example, in the student parent handbook. We have um, a requirement that school leaders make intercom announcements each year in age-appropriate language about if you ever feel that someone is, is talking to you in a way that you think is not respecting you because of a group that you're a member of, this is what you can do. Uh, we've worked with the Boston Student Advisory Council, so there is an okay. equity reporting form in the Student Rights app. Uh, we added this year an online reporting form on the Office of Equity website. So we've been just okay. attacking this every way we okay. can. And I think the results are very obvious since we had a near, a to date, and we're not done with the school year, uh, nearly 800 concerns brought to us this year. And that's compared to a couple, of, um, a couple dozen that were documented the year before this team started our work. And I know, Councilor, uh uh, Sub George had asked about what's the most common investigation, but I didn't know. Were you asking that for educators or just in general? Um, I think Council Janey was asking the, the incident reports. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm yeah. just so I'm, I'm wondering out of those, you know, claims, if you mm -hmm. will, mm -hmm. you know, what what do we see as the largest? Uh, yeah, the two largest categories are race and allegations of sexual misconduct, so um, inappropriate sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome, Councillor. Thank you. Um, unless you have anything else to say, we have no public testimony for this hearing. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much.